What's going on guys, Assalamu alaikum, welcome to Amigos Code. In this Kotlin crash course, I'm gonna teach you pretty much everything you need to get up and running with Kotlin. Kotlin, it's a powerful and elegant programming language for the JVM. And if you're looking to switch from Java to Kotlin, then this is also the course for you. Also Kotlin now is the main programming language for Android applications. So Android, backend, and with multi-platform functionality as well, Kotlin is a great choice. This video is about five hours long and you can find the timestamps and the description of this video in case you want to navigate to a particular section. Before we start this crash course, literally just take one second and smash the like button. Also, if you haven't subscribed, do so. And without further ado, let's go ahead on about Kotlin. Before we dive into Kotlin, I just want to say a few things. The first thing that I want to say is that this course is part of the massive course, which I'm currently recording and in planning for Kotlin developers and in general for anyone really that wants to learn Kotlin. Now, the course is not ready yet. So what I want you to do is join the waiting list. And also on the website, you can basically um, enroll get a certificate, but also there's a form that you can find at the end of the course so that you can give me some suggestions of what are the things that you want to learn about Kotlin. So enroll now on the website so that you can stay up to date with the latest recordings and future updates. But more important, you'll be eligible for an early bird discount once the entire course is out. Let's begin our journey in terms of learning Kotlin. Kotlin is a concise cross-platform and yet fun. It takes all the good things of Java and it adds even more features to make it somewhat a better language. Kotlin is multi-platform, allowing you to share code for different platforms. You can write server-side code. So if you're familiar with the JVM, you can run your Kotlin code on JVM, making it easier for Java developers to switch to Kotlin. Also, you can create multi-platform libraries that works across several platforms and is the official language for Android development. In this page right here, you can see that. So if I scroll down, they've got a simple example of how to get up and running with Kotlin, but we'll go through this uh, later in this course. And here, as I said, Kotlin basically allows you to write code which runs on different platforms. So server side, Android, iOS, desktop and web, which is like amazing. OK, so in this page here, we can then basically click on this button to get started with Kotlin. So also in this page, you can basically click on docs and you can go through this page to learn about Kotlin. But hopefully I'm going to break it down for you in this course. Next, let's go ahead and get up and running with Kotlin. In order for us to get up and running with Kotlin, we've got two options. We can use the IDE, which I'll show you in a second. So IntelliJ IDEA or Android Studio. Or if you want to quickly see how Kotlin is like, you can use the Kotlin online editor. So here, let me just click on it. And in here, we can basically write some Kotlin code. So you can see that this is the version 1.8.21. And in here, you can switch the platform. So most of the times you're going to use JVM, but you can see all these different options. And in here, we can also run the code that you see in here. So we'll go through this in a second. But if I run this, you can see that we have hello world. If I cancel this and then say hello, and then amigos code. And let's just add this into a variable. So var. And then here I'm going to say brand and then colon and then string equals to and in here, just say Amigos code. So we'll go through the syntax in a second. 
but we can take this brand in here and then just add it in here so basically we are printing the variable if i run this you can see that we have amigos code in here so this is basically the playground that allows you to write and basically try kotlin without you having to install anything next let's install intellij and get up and running with kotlin for real Cool. For this course, what we're going to use is the best IDE for the JVM. This includes Java and Kotlin. And by far, IntelliJ is the IDE for, I would say, serious engineers. Okay. If you're using Eclipse, then it's time for you to switch and give this IDE a try because it's the best for overall software development. So in here, we can click on download. And in here, you can see that we can download IntelliJ IDE for Windows, Mac OS, as well as Linux. And if you are on Intel or Apple Silicon, there's also the corresponding platform available for you. So we have Ultimate as well as Community Edition. And the difference between these two is that the Ultimate Edition gives you profiling tools, support for Spring, HTTP Client, JavaScript, TypeScript. So basically the whole front-end shebang database tools, remote development, which is currently in beta as I speak, and also collaborative development, which is not available within the IntelliJ IDEA community. Now, luckily for you, I do have a code that you can use so that you can get IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate for three months. Yes, three months. So if you are taking this course on the website, you should find the instructions on how to get the access code so that you can enjoy this amazing IDE. Cool. Now, in order for us to download this IDE, we're not going to do through this button in here because the best way for you to manage all of your IDEs is by using something called, so if I go to developer tools, navigate to, where is it? Toolbox app. So this right here, is basically a way for you to manage all of your IDEs. You can upgrade, have the settings, and also you can have different versions running at the same time and also previews and whatnot. So download this toolbox app in here. It's absolutely for free and get the DMG or the executable if you're on Windows. And once you have it installed in here, you should see that there's this box icon in here. So if I click on it, you see that this is the JetBrains toolbox. Now at this point, you can install whatever IDE you see here, but the one that we are interested in is the IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate. So the community edition as well, you can install it for free, but I'm going to give you the coupon code so that you can try this IDE here for three months. And if I scroll down, you can see that we have stuff for Python, data, clion.net in here. So you can basically just install and then just try these IDEs and they are so awesome. Cool, so once you have toolbox, go ahead and click on install. So for you, you should see install in here and install IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate. Okie dokie. So upon installation of IntelliJ IDEA, also I forgot to mention that you can click on this clock in here and basically you can create an account. And if you manage to get the coupon, you should actually create an account and then log in and basically you should be on your way to getting the three months for free. So in here, let me just click on IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate. And this is basically the latest version as I speak for IntelliJ IDEA. You might see that maybe at some point when you install IntelliJ, you have the new UI. And um, don't you worry, because now I'll show you also how to switch. So this is IntelliJ. So here we can basically customize IntelliJ, 
add some plugins and whatnot, which we're not going to do at this point. But what we want to do is to create a brand new project. And in here, you can see that we can choose, have a look. So we've got different options in here. So have a look, we've got, so if I show you, we have Maven, we have Spring, we have JavaFX, Quarkos, Ktor, which I will cover at some point as well. Kotlin, multi-platform, Vue, Vite, AWS and whatnot. So what we want to do for us is let's just create in here a new project. So just say new project. And then for the name, I'm just going to say Kotlin in here. And I could also create a Git repository and uh, this will allow me to basically push all the examples so that you have it for reference. So I'm going to take this and then for the language, you can choose Java, Kotlin, Groovy, JavaScript. So what we want is Kotlin and then the build system in here. We're not going to do anything with Maven or Gradle. So just leave IntelliJ. And if you want, you can add sample code. So just leave it as it is. And there's no need for us to configure the advanced settings. So just leave everything as is. And one thing that I actually need to do is I need to change the path. So here I'm going to put this under code and not reviews. And now advanced settings should reflect on that. Okay. So choose whatever location that you want to store your project. And um, also we have here JDK. So I'm using the 17 version, but what you can do is if you don't have anything in here, just basically set your JDK. So click on download JDK and you can see version 20, but at some point you might see 21, 22, 23. So it doesn't really matter, right? So just choose the latest if you want, but in my case, I'm going to leave it at 17. But if I want the latest version, for example, just leave 20 and then you can choose the vendor in here. So either use Oracle or Eclipse in here. So let's just say Eclipse. And for the architecture, I'm going to use this one because I'm on the Mac. I think it's M2 chip and select that one. If you're on Intel, just use this one here. So Eclipse and then download. And you can see that now it has installed and we're good to go. So as I said, the version doesn't really matter. And this is pretty much it. So let's add sample code and let's create. Just give it a second. And ta -da. we have successfully created a project using Kotlin. And now just to make sure that things are working, you see this play button in here. Just click on this play button or in here. So just run. And if this works, it means that we have everything working properly. And you can see that we have hello world program arguments and then exit code and then zero, which means that there were no issues. Awesome. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. As I said, IntelliJ, they have a brand new version of their IDE and basically they have changed the complete look and feel. So let's go ahead and switch to that. So maybe by the time you watch this video, that will be the default, but currently it's in beta mode. So let's just click on this clock in here, project IDE and project settings. And then here we can click on settings. Cool. At this point, under appearance and behavior, you should see new UI and then beta. So here I'm going to enable this and then apply and restart. Perfect. And now you can see that the UI looks much, much better. And um, we'll go through some of these things in a second, but this is pretty much it. So I just want to make sure that we actually switch to the new UI moving forward so that we get the best experience. This is all for now. Catch me in the next one.
Let me walk you through the IDE and some of the things that you see here on the screen, because moving forward, it's very important that you understand what is going on. So if I open a project in here, so you see that we have Kotlin. So this is our folder, which is under Kotlin. This is some Git stuff. And don't worry if it's green in here. That's because I didn't commit none of this. And here, if I click on SRC main, and then Kotlin, you should see that. So here I actually have an extra toggle, but you should see main.kt, which is this file right here. So if I put this smaller, which is this file in here, okay? Now, this is where we type our Kotlin code. And if we want to run it, we could just click on this play button or this one or we can right click on the main and then run, right? So provided that it has this main function, then we're able to run it. So if I change this from main to mains in here, you see that I'm no longer able to run this because every Kotlin code needs the main function. So this is the main entry point for the application, okay? So if I put that back, you can see that we have the play button and we can basically run this and whatever is inside the main function will be executed. Also, what I do have for you is in here. So line number four, if I press command and then Y, you can see that you have the keyboard shortcut so that you can follow along. So both for Mac as well as Linux and Windows. So basically, if I press command Z, you can see that command Z and do the lead line. Okay. And this is very helpful. So with Kotlin code, we have basically functions. So we'll come back to functions in a second, but just bear in mind that this is the main function and is the main entry point of your application. Within your IDE, you can do a bunch of things, which we're not going to have time to cover all the features about the IDE but in a nutshell so this here is the project and this is where you see all of your files in here and here this is all the git stuff integration you can see the structure of your file you can see aws toolkit so for you you might not see this unless you have the plugin installed also you have services we have build if you want to use the integrated terminal you can do it so just click on it and this opens up the terminal in here and problems you can see all the problems that you currently have within your code and also git in here so you have git in here and also you can commit through here so this gives you the history basically so if i click on it you can see what we have so this is currently the master branch which i'm gonna have to change to main later on but this is pretty much it so here if i hide this and most of the time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a separate file for all the examples. So you should see here, for example, when you talk about variables, I'll create a new file in here called variables.kt. So kt is the extension. And then I'm going to commit all of these files so that you have for reference. But most of the time, I'm going to keep my IDE like this full screen so that you see everything nice, big and bold. Also, if you want to access settings, you can click on this clock in here and you can go to the project structure, go to settings, plugins. If you want to change the theme in here, so quite useful. If I click on theme, you can choose between light. Oh, what is this? What is this? <laughs> Don't choose this, please. Uh, or you can choose between the other ones, right? So, oh, this one is quite ugly. So please don't you dare choose these themes. I think this one is quite good, the default. So just use that one. And also if you want to have access to the database tool in here, you have access, which is really nice, but we're not going to touch this later when we touch upon Spring Boot. So then I might even show you how to use this. And finally, you have code with me in here. And basically I can invite you to have a live code session, but we're not going to do this as well. And this is pretty much an overview of your IDE.
All right, let's explore this piece of code, which is the main function. And also I'll show you how to use program arguments. So basically fun in here is a reserved keyword for Kotlin. And then main is the name of this function. So unlike Java, so here, let me just open project and then let me create a new. And then here, I'm going to say Java class. And then here I'm going to say main as well. So we can have two mains. So this one is main.java, whereas this one is main.kt. So here I'm not going to add this to git as of now. So let me just basically don't ask again and then cancel. And this is some Java code. So if I say in here, so main, you don't have to type this, but this in contrast is the exact same thing. So if I say south for a second, and if I open this main.kt, hello world, this is what's inside. Go back to main.java, paste it. And now if I put them side by side, so I'm just going to take Actually, let's just leave the Kotlin on top and then take this tab in here and then put it underneath just like that and then put this full screen. And and also what I'm going to do here is you see line number four and five on main.kt. Let's get rid of it. So I'm just going to select this line, delete or just press command and then Y. Basically, this right here is the exact same thing in Java. So have a look. So in Kotlin, you say fun and then main and you pass some arguments and then you say print line. And in Java is a little bit different, right? So here, have a look, public class main. And then inside you have public static void main string args. And then you have system dot out dot print line <laughs> and then hello world. So you can see that it's way more verbose the Java code when comparing to Kotlin in here, which is quite simple. So we say fun, main, and then args, and then print line. So let me just close this in here. And basically inside of this function, so inside you can basically type some commands. So here print line, basically it's a function. It's another function that allows you to print to the console. Yeah, so this when you run this, so let's just click on the run button or here as well. So this will give you. So if I scroll up or just put this bigger, have a look. Hello world and then program arguments. So this prints to the console and inside you can have a string. We'll come back to strings in a second, but this is just a series of characters and um, also in here, this is how you basically combine a string with some type of function or you basically evaluate some variables. So this is quite neat as well, whereas Java is a little bit different. So in here, we just say print hello world and then we have program arguments. So now program arguments, these are arguments that you pass when you run the program. So what we can do is so in here within IntelliJ, click on these three dots and then click on configuration and then edit. And inside we should see program arguments. So here I'm going to say full space bar and then say apply. And here we can run. And you can see that now we have hello world program arguments, full comma bar. So full comma bar what is doing this is this right here. Okay. So I could say args and then get the first element of args by adding square brackets and then zero. And if I run the program, we should only have foo. Okay. So this right here is a utility function that joins the array to string and we will cover arrays in a second. And this is pretty much it. Now, obviously we don't need none of this as we learn Kotlin and also this right here. So args is optional, so we can get rid of it. 
and this is our main function. Obviously, if we run it, we should see nothing being printed on the console. Cool. So now that you have an understanding of the main function, which is pretty much the main entry point for your Kotlin program. Again, if I remove this name in here, so if I say X, for example, or Z, I cannot run this. Okay. So basically, I should have one function called main in order to run whatever is inside this file. Cool. This is all for now. Catch me on the next one. When writing Kotlin code, you need to understand the reserve keywords. And these are keywords which are part of the language and cannot be used for anything else other than writing Kotlin code. So here you can see they've got a list of hard keywords, soft keywords, modifier keywords, and the list in here, it's quite extensive in here. So field, init, param, set, modifier, const, data, enum, and then special characters and then operators, mathematical operators in here, equal assignment uh, in here for null safety. You can see that basically you've got these keywords and they cannot be used to combine it, do anything else other than writing your Kotlin code. Okay. So let me show you what I mean. So if we look into, so let's have a look, VAR, so VAR in here. So declares a mutable property or local variable. Okay. So if I go back to my IDE and inside of my IDE, let me first basically rename this. So main.kt, I'm going to rename. So go to refactor, rename. And then I'm going to call it reserved and then keywords. So for each lesson, you should see the corresponding file. Okay. So refactor, nothing changes, but the file name and the contents inside are the same. So if I say, for example, var in here, and then brand equals two, and then here just add double quotes and say, for example, amigos code. Right. So this right here is a reserved keyword and I cannot use it to combine it to, for example, var. So instead of the name of the variable being named brand, I cannot say var in here. Right. So var is used to construct a variable. Now the name of this variable, which is brand, cannot be any of the reserved keywords. I cannot say fun, for example because fun is a reserved keyword. However, I can say main, right? So I can give it a name. So this is not a reserved keyword. I cannot say, for example, when it's a reserved keyword. I cannot say if I cannot say val, for example. So these are reserved keywords. So I could say name. So name is not a reserved keyword. And if I want to print the name in here, I can just say name. Here I can run this and we should see Amigos code. Now we have this wiggly line in here and we'll come back to this later, but this is pretty much reserve keywords. Let me go ahead and create a brand new file and their project in here and inside Kotlin, create a new and then here Kotlin class. And I'm going to call this as comments. And then in here, there's no need for us to have a class. So later we will learn about classes. So just have a file, press enter. And now we have the comments.kt and you will have access to this as well, right? So the idea is for every single topic that we cover, we should have the file in here for the corresponding topic. Now, if I want to have the main function, 
I can say fun and then main, right? So basically, you can have as many main functions provided that you will run each file separately, right? So usually you would not have too many main functions, at least one to run the entire program. But for us, because we are learning the programming language, I want to have the main function in all of these files so that I can run each file independently. Cool. So if I collapse project and you saw that we did type the main function. Also, what we can do is you can say main. So just say main. And here you can see that you have two options. You can choose main just like that. Nice and easy. Or if I type main or just may, and then here we could choose the main function with arguments. Cool. Let's just choose the main function without arguments. And here, if I say print, so print allows us to print anything to the console. I'm going to say, hello, please comment. And then me. Okay. So have a look. If I run this, we should see hello, please comment me. And what we can do is we can add a comment in Kotlin by using the forward slash twice. And this basically doesn't execute this statement. So if I run this, you can see that now there's nothing on the console. So this is a single line comment, but also we can have, so if I duplicate this, and let me just say inside here. So let's just change this to multi and then line. So we can have multi line comments by basically adding forward slash and then star. And basically you see that IntelliJ did auto completion for me there. But basically now I can type anything inside. And this is a multi line comment instead of a single line comment. Okay. So this is a difference and comments, basically they allow you to comment your code and they don't get executed. Cool. Let me just go back to this print line in here. So, it's very important I understand exactly what this is doing, right? So print line in Kotlin here, this is used to print to the console. So if I run this, you can see that we have hello, please comment me. So this is from the previous video. There we go. So hello, please comment me. Let me just say hello in here for a second. I'm just going to say hello. And basically, when you say print line in here, you can literally pass anything. You can pass a string, which you're going to learn later. You can pass numbers. You can pass objects. You can pass characters, literally anything, because there's a variation of this print line method, and that's achieved with something called overloading. Now, you learn later overloading when it comes to methods, but in here, so if I say hello, and then here I'm going to say how, or, and then you, right? It doesn't have to be all in caps, so the beginning of each letter. But if I run this, what you should see is hello, and then how are you on a new line. So LN pretty much just says print, and then give a new line, which is equivalent as, so if I say print, so there's also print in here. So if I run this, we should see hello, how are you all in one line. And this is because here we just print, we don't give a new line, and then we print line and then the next print or print line will be on a new line because of this. And this right here is the same as this, so basically forward slash and then N. So this gives a new line, even though I'm not saying print LN, I'm just saying hello, and then new line backslash N. If I run this, you can see that we have hello, how are you? So throughout this course, we're going to use print line quite a lot. And um, also what I want to show you is that print. So if I basically press command and then navigate into it or command B, and you can see the keyboard shortcut down below in here. So command B or control B on Windows. 
and essentially what this is calling is system dot out dot print line and then passing the message so this right here is what this is java have a look java lang public final class system cool so internally all it's doing it's calling system dot out dot print line this all for now catch me on the next one Let's quickly learn about variables. So variables is pretty much a placeholder where you can pretty much store anything. So in here, there's a couple of ways of storing variables. So you could say var, you could say val in here, and uh, there's other ways. But for now, let me just stick with var and then I'll show you better ways of doing this. And I'll explain the difference between var and val very soon. So if I want to store, for example, a sequence of characters in here, I can basically say var and then give the name of the variable followed by, so in here, the data type. And we'll cover data types in a second, but here let's just say string equals two and then double quotes. And now I can add a sequence of characters. So here I can say amigos or let's just say Jamal, for example. There we go. So now this variable in here called name has the contents of Jamal in here. If I want to store Jamal's age, for example, I can say var age and then here colon. And if I say string equals two, and then I want to store, for example, 18. So this is not valid because with strings, you can only store sequence of characters. If you want to store numbers, you can basically say int. Cool, so basically a variable allows you to store one and only one thing. And obviously, if you want to store multiple things inside of a variable, we have something called data structures. So these are arrays, lists, sets, and all that stuff, which we will cover later but those allows us to store multiple values inside of a single variable. Cool. If we want to print, so the variable, we could just say print, and then I can say name in here. Let's also print age in here. So name as well as age. And let's run this. And you can see that we have Jamal and then 18. If you want to print both, on the same line in here, what you can do is you can basically use dollar sign and then curly brackets twice, and then you can pass a value. So you can say name, and this actually has to be within double quotes for this to work, just like that. So name, and then also dollar sign curly bracket, and then age. And what this allows you to do is to format the string. So here I can say name, colon, and then I could say age, and then colon. And here you can see how it works. Cool. So if I remove this, and in fact, let me just put basically duplicate this, and then put age in here. And let me just comment this out so you have it for reference. So remember, single line comments, or we could use multi-line. Let me just move these above, just like that. And if I run this, you can see that now we have name and then Jamal, age, under one single line. And this is the concept of variables. So once you store the variables, so think of a variable as a placeholder to store values, you can use it then later throughout your program. In our case, we just use it to print, but here we can do way more than just printing. But we'll cover strings and all the operations that we can do with variables later. Next, let's learn about data types. If you come from Java background, you will know that in order for you to create a variable, you need to say int and then, for example, a number equals two 
and then basically 10 for example right and this is the Java syntax now in Kotlin we don't have this concept of primitives in here and pretty much everything is an object so in order for us to create for example a variable that represents a number we can do it in multiple ways but let me first show you the exact same syntax that you would have in Kotlin to compare with Java so here you need to say var and then number and you can see that there's a number and then say colon and then here you specify the data type so here this will be an int and then equals to and then 19 for example or 10 right so this is the exact same thing but in Kotlin so Kotlin this is the syntax and this is the Java syntax okay so let me just collapse this in here and this is how you define a variable that stores numbers if you want to store bigger numbers you could say var and then here i want to say l for long and colon and then the data type in here long just like this and then equals to and then here i could add you know a very long number and i need to add the l at the end right so the difference between an integer and a long is the size basically okay so this here stores bigger numbers so the same with double and float so if you want to store decimal numbers you can say var i'm going to name the variable as d in here colon and then double and equals two and then 3.14 or 12 or 13 right and you've seen that i actually been adding semicolons and this is because you know used to java but basically you don't need semicolons in here my bad and also if you want to store bigger numbers that have decimal you can use floats i'm gonna say f in here and this is float equals two and then three dot one four for example and then you have to say f at the end if you if you want to store booleans true or false you can say var and then here i'm gonna say b and then the data type for this is boolean equals to true or false okay so these are two possible values and also if you want to store strings basically a sequence of characters you can say var and then s for string and then here just say string and equals to oops and then here you can say amigos code and finally if you want to store in here so single characters you can say var and then c so this is the name of the variable and i'll come back to naming conventions and all of that good stuff but here we say char in here equals two and then we can add a single character and we need to add this within the single quotes and then here we could just say a for example for amigos code so this is how you basically store single characters and these are pretty much the basic types that you will encounter there's other ones so there's like arrays which i will leave it for later but in a nutshell this is how you go about and create so let me just say here n for number so these are the data types that you're going to use within kotlin and if you have custom data types which you will learn later so with classes then obviously so actually let me just format things then obviously this will not be an integer but for example you might have a person type right so then this will be person but more on that later if you have any questions drop me a message otherwise catch me on the next one There's one type which I want to talk to you, and that is the any type. So you've seen that if you want to have a variable, you can say var, and then here you can say number, for example, colon, and then you can basically specify whether it's an integer, whether it's a double, or any other data type. So here, let's just say 10, for example. So the same with strings, right? So if I want to have name, for example, I say name, colon, and then string, and equals to and then Jamila for example 
So in Kotlin, there's the any data type, and basically the any data type is the type which basically all of these types come from. So integer, string, double, and long, and pretty much any other data type, hence the name any, which means that I can change this type to any, just like this, and also this one, just like that. And from this point onwards, so let me actually go back. So here, for example, if I try to put a string inside, I'm not allowed, right? But if I say any in here, I can literally put anything I want. So here I can say string, I can say number, I can say a decimal like that, I can add a character like that. So just bear in mind that if you see this, it means that this variable right here can basically hold any data type. And if I press command, so just press command on your keyboard and go into it and you can see the keyboard shortcut, command B or control B on Windows and here, any. So public open class, we'll cover public open class as well as package later. But here, the root of the Kotlin class and every Kotlin class has any as a super class. So basically this is the root. So here, let me just close this. And this is pretty much the any data type. And just before we wrap up this video, you shouldn't really use this, right? So you shouldn't have all of your data types as any because it will cause lots of confusion, right? So always be specific on the data type. If you're using strings, just put strings. If you're using integers, then put integers, right? So don't use the any data type for every single variable out there. Catch me on the next one. So far, you've seen that we have var and then the data type, long, double, float, boolean, string, char, and whatnot. So doing this actually is not needed because we can use a feature called type inference, which means that Kotlin will actually determine the type for us without us having to explicitly define the type. So what we can do is we can get rid of the type altogether. So here, this can go just like that. And even in IntelliJ, if I put my mouse in here, you can see that explicitly given type is redundant. And what it means, basically, we don't need this. So we can get rid of that. So let's get rid of all of those. So float as well as boolean, string, basically literally for everything and for characters. And you can see that this is much neater. So don't declare the types. And obviously there are times when you want to declare the types, but we'll cover that later. Most of the times just use type inference, which allows you to define the variable without having to define the type. Cool, so in here you saw that we can define a variable by saying, for example, brand equals two, and then here we can say amigos code. So this is one way of defining the variable and we can also define a variable using the val keyword. So this is val keyword. And here we could just say, let me just say B for now, equals to, and then amigos code. Okay. So let me actually say brand and then val and brand and then var, just like that. Cool. Now, what is the difference between var and val? Well, with var, basically, I can change the contents of the variable once it's been assigned, which means that I can go, right, so here I can say brand var equals to something else. So here I could say code and then with amigos code, for example, right? So this is the difference. Whereas with val, so when you define the variable val, you basically cannot perform the exact same thing. So here, if I duplicate this line 
and and bring it down just like that and then change this from var to val so val in here so i want to change the contents of brand val from amigos code to something else i cannot and you can see that it's telling me val cannot be reassigned change to val instead so basically this is how to create an immutable variable meaning that once you define it you cannot change it so in java this would be the equivalent of so in here so in java this is final and then string and then brand equals to and then amigos code so this is the equivalent in java okay and once you assign this you cannot reassign it and this is the difference between brand and val now obviously which one should you choose so technically you should prefer immutability always because it's easy to reason about changes especially when you are within a multi-threaded environment but this is more on the advanced stuff so for now i would say use val and if you need to reassign the variable change it to var okay so javascript they have the exact same concept so javascript they've got var and const so it's the exact same concept cool this is pretty much it and let me just comment this because otherwise we'll have an issue this is pretty much it catch me on the next one Okie dokie, you've seen val in here. So val, let's just say name equals to, and then Jamal. And you've seen var i equals to, and then zero. The difference is that with val, this is read only. And this one is mutable. So you can change the value in here, right? So if I try to change name, to equal something else I cannot but if I do var or actually sorry I equals to and then two for example I can do this all right so let me just comment this out in here and we also have something called const which allows us to create values that will never change so the const keyword is as follows you say const and then you give it a name now in here, if I pretty much just say const and then the value of pi, for example, equals two. So const, and then I need to specify whether val or var. So let's just say val in here and the value of pi, let's just say 3.14. Let's just keep it simple, right? So basically in Java, this is the same as static and then final. This right here, is the same as so final basically this is the same as final in java and this is static and then final now obviously if you want to create a constant you basically have to define it outside so basically it cannot be inside of a function now you might be saying right so i could actually define the same thing without val right so what is the difference well the difference is that const val so this value is known before code execution before you even run your code so we know this value in here whereas val so if i just say val then it's impossible right because i could have so let's just say in here if i say we're going to learn, you're going to learn this later but if i say func and then get and then pi and then the value and we're going to have parentheses and here's a colon and let's just define the type so this will be double so let's just say double and then equals to 3.14 okay don't you worry too much about this but this is me creating a function that just returns the value of pi which is 3.14 now with a constant right here so you see that we have a function and if I also say the value of pi in here is get and then pi this does not work 
because I'm dependent on this code to load the actual value. So here, if I put my mouse in here, you can see const val initializes should be a constant value. Whereas if I say val, and then I'm going to say pi in lowercase equals to get and then pi value. So this is allowed. And if I say const, this is not allowed, right? So this is the same as the final keyword in Java. And this is static final in Java. So this is how you create constants in Python. So it simply means that when you say const, this value must be known before execution. So here, if I say 3.14, I know the value, right? So the value is here and it's not been computed from somewhere else. Cool. Hopefully you understand the difference between const and val and var. And if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, catch me on the next one. In this video, let me walk you through nulls with Kotlin. So here, let's say that we have a variable called name and let's just say Jamila. And in Java, we can take name and then say equals to and then null. Now in Kotlin, this is not possible. So Kotlin type system is aimed at eliminating the danger of null references. So it means that if you want to reassign a variable to something null, this right here cannot be null, right? And this will avoid many issues. And in Java, this is the issue. So null pointer exception. So this guy in here. And uh, it's one which is very common to beginners to understand why is it happening. But basically, if you have your variable that is null and you try to perform any operation on a variable which is null, then you have the null pointer exception. Whereas in Kotlin, this is not possible, which means that you can safely say, for example, so here, if I print and we'll cover strings in detail later, but I can say name dot. And then here you can see that we have a couple of methods. So get compare equals to string in here, drop last filter, lowercase and whatnot. So let's just say, for example, uppercase. So uppercase. So this will take this name in here and transform all characters to uppercase. So if I run this main function, you can see that we have Jamila in uppercase. Now, if you, for example, want the ability of a variable to be null, what you can do is the following. So here, let's just say var and then brand, and then let's define the type this will be a string and this can be equal to and let's just say amigos code and now if i take brand and say equals to null so basically null in here so this is not allowed and for us to do this we need to add question mark in here so now this variable in here can have the null value which means basically pointing to nothing so in this case the variable name is pointing to the string reference called Jamila, whereas here it's just pointing to literally nothing. So if we print this value, this will be null. Cool. So if I take this actually, so let's just put it null in here. And if we say print line and here we're going to pass brand dot and then uppercase, just like that. Now immediately you can see that basically it's telling me the value of brand is always null, right? So if I try to run this, I'm not allowed, right? So we get compilation error. So what we have to do is just add a question mark. So question mark. And now it says, right, so we know that this can actually be null. So in order for us to, you know, invoke the uppercase on the variable brand, which might be null, we need to be sure. So it's either going to uppercase or it's going to print null, right? So here, if I run this and you can see that we get null in here and this is how Kotlin protects us from null pointer exceptions. So now here, if I was to say 
vehicles code. So we don't get, so if I run this, we don't get no, but we get amigos code instead in uppercase and we're good to go. Now, there are a couple of things that we can do with this syntax in here, but we'll discuss this later when we touch on if statements. But for now, I just wanted to teach you the concept of no safety with Kotlin. Okie dokie, let's cover the string class in Kotlin, which allows us to store a sequence of characters. And pretty much if you want to store any text, this is what you should use. So let's learn. So here, if I want to create a string, for example, I just say val, and I can say, for example, name equals two, and we can say Ahmed, for example. So this is one way of creating the string. Or if you want also, you can add string just like this. And as you saw that this is redundant, okay? So let's just remove this. Now we have this variable called name that stores this text. If I wanna print the variable or the string itself, I just say print ln, and then in here we can run. And you can see that we have Ahmed in here. So. With strings, we can perform a bunch of things with it. So here, if I say dot, this gives me the list of all possible methods available to us. So you can see uppercase. So you've seen this where you want to turn the entire string to uppercase. So let me just in here duplicate this command D and then say dot and then uppercase in here. If you want this to lowercase, you just say lower and then case. So you say dot and then uppercase. And then here you invoke the function itself. We'll cover functions later, but this is how you turn the string to uppercase as well as lowercase. Also, if you want to know the number of characters that this string has, just say dot and then length. So length is actually a property and not a method available within the string class. And we'll cover also properties as well as functions and methods. Cool. Let's explore other methods. So if I say print ln, I can say name. And basically, I can actually grab the first character of the string by adding. So I can add the square brackets in here, and then I can specify an index. So zero means this index in here, one, two, three, and then four. So if I duplicate this and then say four in here, this will give me capital A, and this will give me D in here. So if we run this, let's just run this for a second. And you can see that we have capital A, lowercase d, We've got five, so Ahmed has five letters. In here, we turn Ahmed to all uppercase, and here we turn Ahmed to all lowercase. So you've got a bunch of these functions in here, and um, the best way of learning this is basically to explore the documentation. So if I say name dot, and in here, I can basically navigate and then see whether there's a method that does what I want, but this is kind of it, right? So you have a bunch of these that you can use. So any is a sequence for each and whatnot. So is null or blank. So is not empty. So for example, here, if I say is, let's say is empty right here, right? So if I say is empty, so we know that this will give us false because there's something within that string. But if I pass an empty string like so, so empty string, and then I invoke dot is empty, run it, this will give me true. Okay, so you've got a bunch of these methods that you can use within the string class. And the way you're going to get used to these methods is just by using this string class. And uh, it's one which you use quite a lot within any programming language, to be honest. Cool. The other thing that I want to cover is, let's say that you want to 
in here, let's just say that you have a variable, so val, and then you have h. So h equals 2, and then let's just say 20. So here, if you want to print two strings together, you can say print in here. Or in fact, let's just add it to, so here var, and then let's just say message equals 2. And if you want to combine both the name variable and h into one, you could just say name plus, and then here you can concatenate another string to give a space, and then plus, and then h. So you could do this. And if I print the message, so this right here will give us name and then 20, Ahmed. Now, don't do this. So this is the old way of doing things. And the better way is for you to use the string template. So here, just add double quotes and add dollar sign and then curly brackets. And then here you can specify name. So the variable itself should go inside here. And also we can have the H. So dollar sign, oops, like that, curly bracket, and then H. So this is a better way of doing things. Now, even better, what we can do is we can remove the curly brackets. So you can see that the syntax now becomes way shorter and easier to read. And this should be actually val, not var, val. And you can see that we have the message and here we're combining both. And the cool thing here is that I can say name, right? And then here, maybe I want to have a comma, for example, and then age, just like that. If I run this, there we go. You can see that I have name. So this is the string and then Ahmed, this is the value and then comma space age and then colon and then 20 in here. So this is how you combine strings and this is the best way of doing so. And obviously this data type here is actually a string. So here, if I say colon and then string, it returns a string and we can perform all the other methods that you've seen. The other thing that I want to cover is multi-line strings with Kotlin. And that is, let's say that we have a method in here. So let's just say that we have a variable. So val and then email, and then I can say equals. And here just add double quotes once, twice, and then three times, and then press enter. So once you press enter, this will be auto filled for you. So trim indent. And what we can do now Inside here, we can basically have, so hello, how, are, and then you, okay? So we can basically have line one, line two, line three, line four, so on and so forth. So if I print, let's just print the email. So email in here and then run this. Have a look. So you can see that we have, hello, how are you? in three different lines, right? And the cool thing here is that this actually keeps the indentation for us. So if I add, you know, two spaces in between, run it, oops, not debug it, but run it. You can see that we have, hello, how are you? The other cool thing is if you want to add, for example, name, so hello and the name, you wanna pass a name, for example, into this string. So here you can say percent, and then S. So which means that you want to pass a string. And now I can say email dot and then format in here. And I can pass the arguments, right? So here I can say, for example, hello, and then Anna. Okay, so this will be hello, Anna, how are you? So if I run this, have a look. So we have hello, Anna, how are you? Now, obviously, if you want to pass, for example, a digit, there's percent %d, and you can even format things. And I would encourage you to look into how you can format your strings. But this is pretty much the multi-line string feature within Kotlin. Format, right? So format doesn't have to be with multi-line. So it could also be within a normal string in here. So here, if I say dot, and you can see that we have format, 
and you can pass whatever formatting so percent s for example and then that will be replaced as well awesome this is pretty much what i wanted to cover about strings if you have any questions drop me a message otherwise catch me on the next one In this video, let's learn about how to compare strings in Kotlin. So in Kotlin, we have an extra operator, which is the triple equals, which we don't have in Java. And uh, it kind of works the exact same way. So let me break it down to you. So let's say that we have a variable. So here we'll say val name one equals two and then Sally. So we have this variable in here called name one. And in here, let's have a, another variable. So I'm going to say val name and then two equals to Jamila. Now, in here, what we are now in here, when we want to compare these two to see whether they are the same, we have a couple of options. So you know that this right here. So when we say val, this is a read only value in here. So if you want to reassign this, you are not allowed. So if I say name two, or name one equals to something else not allowed so if we want to compare these two values we have to use the so if i say print ln in here the variable name so name one and then we can say equals so double equals and then in here we can say name and then two so if i run this in here you should see that we have false because in here name one not equal to name two so the contents of name one not equal to name two now in java this here so um it wouldn't work right so if you took my java course you would have known that this right here it's not used for strings and in kotlin also what we can do is we can say name one dot and then equals so one variable equals to another variable. So if I run this in here, you can see that both of them are returning false. Now, if I create a third variable, so val, and then here I'm gonna say name three equals to, and then Sally. And let's change now in here. So let's ignore name two, and let's change this from name two to name three, and the same in here. If we run this, what do you think the output? If we run this, what do you think the output will be? So here, if I run this, you can see that both of them are returning true. Okay. Now, this is actually correct, and that's because when we say equals, right? So double equals or equals. Here we are comparing the contents, i.e., whatever we have inside. So if this was to be lowercase s in here and run this, you can see that now both of them are returning false, right? Cool. So this is nice and easy. Now, what about if I put this back and you know that the equals in here and dot equals will return true. So what about now if I create the string using this so just say string so this is another way of creating strings and inside paste sale so just like that so sale just like this and say dot and then two car array so this is how we create a string using the string construct so this is a constructor and you will learn more about constructors later so now what do you think the output for this will be well the first one in here so let's just um, use some some string template so double quotes and then i'm going to say double equals and then dollar sign and in here let's basically print the result of this like that and then end with double quotes and we'll do the same here so double quotes here and double quotes and then close this with curly bracket and then dollar sign curly bracket and here we're going to say dot and then equals so i want you to see the output 
Now, what do you think the output for this will be? So double equals in here versus dot and then equals. So if we run this, let's have a look what the output will be. So in here we have true and then true, right? So here, nothing has changed. And from this, you know that the double equals as well as dot equals on strings, they are comparing the contents. So in Java, this right here, so equals, so two equals is comparing the memory location. And if you want to achieve the exact same thing in Kotlin, what you do is the following. So here we pretty much say, so let me just duplicate this in here. And we say triple equals in here. So now this is actually comparing the memory location, right? So inside of the string pool, which I'm about to show you, if I run this in here, so let's just run this with triple equals, have a look, this is false, right? So in here, what we've done is, so when I say string and then we pass Sally, so this is creating a brand new object and it's not reusing the contents of Sally, which is stored within this string pool. So if I was to go back in here, so let's just get rid of that in here as well. And this right now should give us true before it give us false. But if I run it, you can see that we have equals, right? So they are the same in terms of the value, in terms of the reference, and here the value as well. And this is pretty much how you compare strings in Kotlin. Now, let me put this back in here so that you have it for reference. But let me explain this in a diagram. So what is happening is the following. We have a variable called name one and the value of it is Sally. Then we created name two, which is equals to Jamila. Now these, when we create them, the value for them is stored within the string pool. Then when we say name three and then we say string, so we basically use the string constructor, this is creating a brand new object called Sally. So that's why when we use the triple equals, it's comparing the reference to where they are in memory. And obviously you can see that name three and name one, they are in completely two different locations in memory. Hence the triple equals returns false, but double equals and dot equals will return true because the contents are the same. So Sally and then Sally with capital S. And you saw that when we changed it back, so when we changed it from the normal way of creating strings, i.e. in here. So this is basically how you're going to create strings all the time. And let me have it for reference in here so you can see. And let me just remove that in here. And also to car array or char, whatever you want to say it. And let me just comment this. So if we were to create a string like this, right? So variable name three equals to Sally, what's going to happen is name three will basically check whether there is a value for Sally within this string pool. And if it does, it just points to the exact same location. So this is the beauty of string pool and it's a special area in memory just for strings because strings are the most used data type in Kotlin and pretty much in all programming languages and they are a bit special in terms of how they are stored so that it increases performance and also that we don't waste memory, okay? So when we create strings the normal way, it basically checks whether there is something within the string pool. If there is, it just points to it. If not, it will just create in the string pool and then refer to it. But when you create using the string constructor, it basically creates a brand new object. So if you were to create name four, for example, in here, right? So name four. And basically, if you use the string, so here, if you just say like that, so val, and then basically name four, 
equals to and then sale so if you do this <coughs> name four will point to sale inside of the string pool just like this right however if you do this in here name four equals to so this is what i've been saying string and then you put sale inside and then you say two and then car or char array just like that so let me just put this on the side like this so if you do this way then it's not even going to reuse the exact same sale in here it's going to create a brand new object in here and then it's just going to point to it like so and you can see that now there's a bunch of waste sally here sally here and sally here so when it comes to strings avoid creating strings like this and always do it this way if you have any questions on equality and uh, string pools feel free to let me know otherwise catch me on the next one Cool. In this video, let's learn about the arithmetic operators that ships with pretty much any programming language and Kotlin also is no different. So in here, you saw that if you have, so here we can have numbers. So if I have 10, so number 10 equals two, and then val, and then number, let's just say number two equals two, and then two in here. So let's just name this as number one. And if you want to add these two numbers, you can print. So let's just print and we can say number and then one plus and then number two. So this is how you add numbers together. So if you want to subtract, it's the same thing, but you just say minus. If you want to divide, you divide like so. And if you want to times these two numbers, you just add the star in here. So also there's something called the mod so let me just duplicate this instead and this pretty much is the remainder and this goes like this so 10 and then mod so the percent sign here and then the number two so 10 mod 2 it means how many times 2 goes into 10 basically so it goes into 10 five times and the remainder is zero if i run this in display button in here you can see that we have 10 plus 2 is 12, 10 minus 2 is 8, and then 10 divided by 2 is 5, and then 10 times 2 is 20, and 10 mod 2 is 0. So if I also change this from 3, so 3 goes into 10 3 times, and the remainder will be 1. If I run this, there we go. You can see that this time is 1, and all the other operations actually change as well. And this is pretty much it. Let me just add some formatting in here. So here we could just actually, let me just select this right here and then control G a couple of times. And here I'm going to add double quotes and then this will be dollar sign and then curly brackets. And let's go on the other side and then add parentheses or actually double quotes. And we're going to finish it like so there we go and then here i'm going to say add space and here i'm going to say oh actually let's just add this the symbol right so plus this is minus this is division this is subtraction or oh, actually multiplication <laughs> and this is the modulo so here and if I run this, there we go. You can see that now we have formatted the output. Cool. Obviously, you can format this better, but uh, because my font is quite big, I'm going to leave it as is. And as always, because I'm used to Java, I just need to remove the semicolons because it's not needed. This is pretty much the arithmetic operators that Kotlin comes with. And pretty much this is standard in every language.
you've seen all of these operators in here so plus minus division multiplication as well as the module let me actually show you there's a class called math and basically the way you use it is let me actually show you the long way so here if i say kotlin so this is a package basically and we'll learn about packages later and then have a look math and here i can say dot and i've got access to a bunch of things so here i've got the value of pi if i want to know the value of pi and you can see the data type is double there's absolute methods a cos a sign probably remember this from gcse level seal cosine exponential floor log max so if you want to know the max between two numbers this is how you do it right so in here round you can also round a number so you've got tan and i think that's pretty much it right so let's say that here i want to know the value of pi so i could just say pi and i can print this so let's just print just like this and if i run this so here run this guy and there we go so this is the value of pi in here if i want to know the max between two numbers so i just say max so this time i could just say max instead of the fully qualified name okay so here we can also remove this and we have we and we have to import properly right so from kotlin and then dot math or dot pi basically so one thing to note is so when you do this it actually adds this import statement at the very top and we'll cover this later but basically this is just saying right so bring the value of pi which lives in a different package into this class in here and also the same with max right so max in here so we can say max and if i press command p it takes two numbers so 10 oh actually let's just say i think we have number one and also number two right so between these two numbers i want to know which one is the max so let me just say print and just like that run this and you can see that 10 is actually the max if you want the min so let me just remove this and let me just remove this so oops not like that but let me just get rid of that so i have space so let's say 10 and 3 i think or 2 it doesn't matter so if i want min i just say min in here and here it says that it doesn't know min that's because we need to import min so you can use intellij to import the function so just put your mouse in there or you can duplicate this and say min in here and it should work if you don't want to import everything so here you can see that i do have a bunch of imports i could just say star so pretty much just bring everything and i can get rid of all of this right right here and you can see that uh, some people prefer this some people don't i personally disagree with this so i like to import whatever i need instead of bringing the entire world cool so if i want to know the min so here if i run this and we'll cover packages later so the minimum is three if you want to round so on and so forth so let's just explore one more method so print line and here i can say kotlin dot and then math dot and let's have a look square root s square root right here so square root in here of basically let's have a double so 5.0 sorry s q square root s q r t so run this and you can see that it's two point yada right so uh, not helpful and if you want to i think round print line and then kotlin dot and then math and in here let's just use round so if i want to round so let's just pass a double so 4.2 for example if i want to round this you can see that this gives us four right so if it's 4.5 so 4.5 in here run it this gives us four so it always rounds down so 
I'm going to leave it here, but basically just bear in mind that this is how you use the math class within Kotlin and this is actually not needed. And I just did this to show you the imports, but we'll cover more packages and imports later. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. Since we are working with numbers and let's focus on the plus, plus and minus, minus operators. So plus, plus and minus, minus. Let me just comment this in here. So if we have, so let's just say print ln and then we have a number. So let's just say in here, let's just say val number equals two and then let's just say 10 in here. If I want to increment this number by one, all I do is I could say plus and then one, right? So if I run this file in here, you can see that I do have 11 in here. If I want to increment by two, I could say two, so on and so forth, right? But there's a shorthand when you want to increment just by one, and I use it, and that is using the plus plus operator in here. And the space in here, it's not needed. Now, this here is complaining because when we say number plus plus, remember, if it's a val, it means that we cannot do this. So val, it means that we cannot take number and say equals two and then something else, right? So in our case, we want to say 11, okay? So if it's val, we're not allowed to do this. But what we want to do is change this to var. So hopefully now you understand the differences. And if I run this, you should see that we have 10. But why is that? Right? So why is that? So in order for me to explain, we have two concepts. We also can do number plus plus before. So plus plus before, just like that. And if I comment this out, this second line for a second, and then run this, you can see that now we have 11, which is nice. So the difference is, so in here, plus plus before the number increments and returns the value. So that's why you see 11. So increments first and then returns the value. Whereas with the second one, number plus plus in here, this returns the number and then increments. When I mean returns the number, when it prints out, it has the current value. So it prints the current value and only then it increments the number, which means that the next time that I print number in here, this will be what? Have a guess. So if I run this, this will be 11. Cool. So hopefully you understand the difference. Now, if I was to, so in here, remove this, have a guess what this will be. So let's go step by step. So print ln plus plus number. So this will be 11 because it increments the number first and then returns, right? Then in here, what this will be. So the value now is 11. So this is return 11 and then increment. So this will be 11. And in here, this will be what? 12. Cool. Let's just check whether we are right. And there we go. 11, 11, and then 12. Cool. So the other thing that we can do is, so we have plus plus, but we also have minus minus. So here, let me just duplicate this twice. If I say minus minus, and let's just say minus minus here. And finally, let's print the number in here. So in here, we have 12. We say minus minus number. This basically decrements and returns the number. So this will be 11. And in here, the number is 11. So we're going to return the number and only then decrement. So this will be 11. And then the final number should be 10. So the original number. So if we run this, we should see 11, 11, and then 10. And this is pretty much the plus and minus operators. If you have any questions on this, 
please let me know. Otherwise, catch me on the next one. Cool. Let me talk to you about the plus operator because it's very special in a sense that when you are dealing with numbers, it has a completely behavior to when you are working with strings. So you know how to work with numbers now, strings, and um, you've seen all of this. Now, if I say sum equals to 10 plus 10, so these are two numbers, and sum string 10 in here, plus and then 10. What do you think the value will be? So this one here, what do you think? This will be what? 10 plus 10 is 20, of course. But here, 10 plus 10. So what this will be? If we run this, there we go. So here, have a look. Sum on numbers, 20. Sum on strings, this is 1,010. But this is wrong, right? So basically, the plus sign in here, and uh, this is basically a concept of polymorphism, which means that many forms. So the plus sign, when applied on numbers, it performs addition. When applied on strings, it just performs concatenation. So you're just concatenating these two strings together and not performing any arithmetic operation on these two strings. So bear that in mind, okay? Very important concept that many beginners fail to understand, but this is what's special about the plus operator. And bear in mind that this only applies to plus. So here, when dealing with strings, I cannot say minus, right? So 10 minus another string, right? So here I cannot say times, nor divide, nor modular, right? So this only applies to the plus operator. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. Cool. Now let me teach you that if you have, let's say in here we have a number. So let's just say number and then equals to and then 10. So this is a string and I want to print in here. Let's just say that we want to print in here 10 and then plus and then basically the number 10, right? And you saw that this does not work, right? So when you have a number and you want to work with strings, you know, these are two different types. And what we can do is we can take number and then convert that into a number. So just say number dot and then say two and have a look. So we have two string, two big decimal, big integer, two boolean, two byte, two char array, two double, two int, so on and so forth. So you could convert one type to another. So say two int and now I've converted this string right here into an integer. So if we run this, there we go. So now we have 20. So all I want to show you here is that if you have, so if you have, let's say 10 in here and you want to, I don't know, maybe you want to add it to number 10. So let's just say 10 in here, right? So this now is the way around. So this is a number and we want to concatenate a number with a string. So if I want to turn this number into a string, we can say 10 dot and then two. And then here we can say string. So 10 and then two string. So I think, hold on. So 10 dot and the IDE doesn't really recognize that I'm within here. So I think you have to basically add a space and then basically say dot again or dot and then basically press control space. I think this is a bug, but if I have in here number or let's just say val number and then two equals to 10 this time. So then here I think number two dot and basically you have no issues. Okay. 
So I think I just found a bug with IntelliJ. So 10 dot, it doesn't work. Have a look. I don't see the auto completion, but if I press control space, then it works. Cool. So here, if you want to convert a number to a decimal or to a string, just say to, and then you can see to byte, to int, to float, to long, to string. There we go. And then I can say plus number. And now remember, so string to string, this will be 1010. So if you want to convert any number to a different data type, just say dot two. So dot. So in here, let's just take a double, for example. So val, let's say D for double equals two, three point zero. And if I print D and let's also print D in here, I can say dot. And then here to have a look to integer, to string, to flow, to double, to big decimal. So to duration as well and whatnot. But here, let's just change that to an integer. So it will be three instead of 3.0. Have a look, 3.0 and three. And just before we end this video, IntelliJ is actually telling me that I can replace this in here with, so in here we can replace this. So let me just duplicate this line and leave it here for you. So we can replace that with this. So I've just put my mouse in there. Now the reason why I did that, so to string is just to show you how to convert from one data type to another. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. In this section, let's learn about the constructs that Kotlin has when it comes to conditionals and decision making. First, let's learn about the Boolean data type, which you've seen before, but let me actually go in detail now. So a Boolean is pretty much a data type that allows you to hold true or false values. So here, if I was to say, for example, is and then adult equals to and then here I can say true or I can say false. So this is a Boolean. Okay. So is adult, this is false. Then we can say, for example, val is and then male, for example, equals true. Right now here, you can see that the possible values are true or false. And we'll come back how to use these values in a second but in a nutshell this is what a boolean is if i was to print these values it will just print true or false so if i was to say print and then is adult it's just going to print in here if i run this it's going to print false the value right here awesome so this is false nice and easy now in kotlin everything is an object and this means that also booleans can be null. So here, if I say, for example, val order and then completed. So maybe you want to represent an order, right? So ordered complete equals two. And let's say that we want to assign the value of null. So null means that it has literally no value assigned to it. Now, in order for us to say that this is actually a boolean right here we need to use the data type so here we say boolean so this is a boolean and in order for us to assign this to null we need to say that this actually needs a question mark in here remember the question mark and this now is a boolean whose value is null so booleans can be false true or null I'll come back to when we use these values and that's basically with if statements and I'll show you the best way of using them, especially when they are null, which is really important. So here, if I was to print the order completed, we'll just get null. There we go. So false, null, and let's also print the other one, which is, let me just do it here. And this is is and then mail. And let me just pull this up. There we go. If I run this, 
you can see that we have false, true, as well as no. So these are the three possible values for booleans. Cool, now that you know the three possible values for booleans, now let me quickly explain the naming convention for booleans. So with booleans, you kind of want to always ask a question. So instead of saying adult in here, you say is and then adult, is male here, is, so is and then order completed right here. So this is a better name. Okay, so you basically always try to ask a question that will return true or false. For example, did you eat? Did you sleep? Right? So you can also say, for example, in here, has and then slept. Right? So is slept doesn't really make sense, but has slept. Right? Or maybe is and then completed as well. So all I want you to bear in mind is whenever you work with booleans, so let me just put this right here at the bottom. So you always want to ask a question for the variable name that you are about to create and even with functions as well, right? So later you learn about functions. So if your function returns a Boolean value, then you always want to ask a question. So this makes much sense instead of just saying sleep or slept or completed okay so is has and basically try and always ask a question when naming your booleans this is pretty much it catch me on the next one cool let me now talk about logical operators when dealing with booleans so let's say that in here we have two booleans, so val and then is and then female, for example. And here, let's just say false. So if you want to combine these two booleans in here, so here, I'm just going to print, but we could also store the result into a variable. So if you want to combine two booleans, you say is adult, and then you can say and. So this is the and operator. And this should be is female. So here I'm saying is adult and is female. So when you use the and in here, and this is the conjunction or logical and, so every single expression in here has to be true in order for the entire expression. So this entire expression to evaluate to true. So this has to be true. This also has to be true in order for the output to be true. If I run this, you can see that this is false. Okay. And that's because of is female is false. So if I was to change this to true now in here and then run this, there we go. You see that this is true and we can actually combine. So let me just come back in here. We can combine multiple ands. So you're not just limited to one and, but if you want to have another and, and in here, you can say true as well, right? So let's actually put this into a variable in here. So val and then is and then pilot, for example, or is driver. So is driver equals two and then true. So now if I say is driver in here, and if I run this, you can see that this is still false. And that's because of this is female. So this is the and. We also have the disjunction, which is the or. So here, if I say print line, I can say is and then adult or. So or. So these two pipes or is female right and or it's also known as a disjunction so this is the logical or so this basically at least one of them has to be true for this entire expression to evaluate to true so is adult in here so this is true 
then it bails out because it doesn't really matter or okay so if i run this so this will give us true in here true so we've got two outputs so the last one is this one and it's true because this is true then it doesn't need to know whether this is true now if we flip things around so if we say is female and then or and then is adult is female this equals to false then it tries the other value right so or so is this true no all right or let's try if this is true if this is true then it's going to be true so if we run this this will be true and if this here is false so if his adult is false the entire thing will be false right so at least one of them has to be true and again you can combine multiple ors together in here to create a more complex expression and the last thing that i want to show you is the negation so negation works as follows so you can take whatever boolean you have so if i say is and then adult and you can say is not adult so you basically you flip the expression so you say exclamation mark and this now when you say is not so this will basically flip the value if the value is true this will be false if the value is false this will be true so if i show you so if i run this is adult is true but now it's going to be false and similarly is female right so here is female so if i want to say if <clears throat> if if i want to say is not female i just say print line and then not is and then female so this basically flips the value for us so if i run this this will be true right so it's not female basically <laughs> all right so this is pretty much it now obviously also you could use parentheses so here if you want to combine let's say line number five if you want to say is adult and so here so and we can combine here we can combine these two in here with parentheses and basically this becomes now a sub expression and at least one of them has to be true right for the entire thing to be true which means that now have a look is female and is driver this will evaluate to false false and true so false and true equals to false but if i was to maybe negate this so let me just run this so you see that this is actually false in here false but if i was to say is not a female right so this now becomes true and this is true as well and basically now the whole expression is true if i run this this will be true but also what i could do is if i don't flip the value i could say or in here so you can see how i'm combining multiple logical operators in here so is female so this is false or is driver so this entire thing now will be true because this driver is true is adult true true and true equals to true if i run this there we go have a look true awesome so this is pretty much how to use the logical operators with kotlin if you have any questions drop me a message otherwise catch me on the next one Cool, you've seen logical operators. Now let me teach you about comparison operators. So comparison operators allows us to compare two or more values and the result of the comparison is a Boolean. So if we have, for example, so val, and then let's just say end one for number one, and let's just say that this is 10 val and two equals two and then 20. What we could do is i'm just going to say in here val result equals two if i want to check whether number one is greater than number two i can say n one greater 
then number two. So I could just say N2 in here. And if I print the result, so print and then the result, if I run this, you should see that this gives us false. So this is a Boolean value. So this is false. So this expression right here returns true or false. So this is greater. If you want less, so let's just basically take this and not even store it within a variable and just put it here so that you have access to it. So if you want to check whether it's greater or equal, you just say greater or equal. If you want to say whether it's less, so so less, you basically flip the value. So less. And the way that I remember this is basically this sign right here has a shape of an L. So this is less. And here, this is less or equal. And also, if you want to check whether the numbers are equal, you could just say N1 and then double equals. So these are the comparison operators. So if we run this, you should see that we have a bunch of booleans, right? So here, so the first one was what? The first one was N1 greater than N2, false greater or equal false is it less yes true less or equal true and then finally is it equal to n2 and obviously there are two different numbers hence you've got false and this is pretty much how you compare numbers using the comparison operators this is pretty much it catch me on the next one Okie dokie, you've learned about logical operators, you've also learned about comparison and booleans. Now, where they come into play is with if statements. So if statements allows us to execute a piece of code based of a condition. So let's say that we want to execute. So we want to say if, so this is the if statement. So if N1 is greater than N2. So if N1 is greater than N2 in here, we want to have a smiley face. So print and then here LN and let's just have a smiley face just like that. So if N1 is greater than N2, we want to print a smiley face. If I run this, it doesn't print anything. Why? Because N1 in here is 10. 10 is less than 20. Hence, this right here is false. But if I also change N1 to 30, right? We could run this. And now we have a smiley face. So N1 now is bigger than N2. Now here, obviously, we could say greater or equal. We can also have and. So we could say and as well, right? So as you've seen before, and this right here, so the entire expression evaluates always to true or false, right? So if I was to say that, you know, N1 is greater than N2, but also N1 is less or equal to 30, for example. Well, this will be true, right? Because N1 here is greater or equal than n2 30 and 1 is less or equal than 30 so if i run this you can see that we have a smiley face but if i change this to 31 in here so 31 run this this doesn't print anything in here right that's because n1 in here it's not less or equal than 30. It's actually 31. So this code will evaluate if this entire thing is true. You could also say or if you want, right? So or, remember? So or, and now basically one of them has to be true. So if I run this, this time it prints because the first expression is true. Cool. So this is the if statement. Also, what I want to show you is that if we have, so print ln and then some code, 
this will always print regardless because it's not within the if statement okay so if we basically here let's just say and and i want you to see that this is false but some code will always be executed because it's outside of the if statement okay so any code that you put inside will evaluate if this expression is true Next, let's talk about the else statement. All right, so you saw if statement, but what about if you want some code to be executed when this is false, right? So basically the default when this expression in here doesn't evaluate to what you are asking for. Well, for that, we have the else statement. So else in here. So this will be executed when this expression doesn't evaluate to what you are looking for. So here we want this to be true in here. So if this is true, this will be executed. Otherwise, this will always be executed. So let's just take this duplicate, bring it down and let's just add a sad face for example there we go cool so if i run this in here we should see that we have a sad face why because n1 in here yes is bigger than n2 but it's not less than 30 right so 31 so if we change this to or let's just change this to an or there we go. So this time this should print and the else will not be printed. So let's just run this. And you can see that we have the happy face and some code. So some code is always printed. And this right here is our if statement. So if else, if this is true, then execute this and then skip this carry on. If this is false, if this is false, skip this so inside and execute this piece of code and then carry on. And this, my friends, is if else statement. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that so else it's not needed, right? So if you don't need the else statement, by all means, get rid of it, right? But if you want something to be executed, in the event that the if expression is false, then add the else statement, right? So this is valid as you've seen before. Right, this is all for now. Catch me in the next one. All right, so you know about the if, you know about the else. What about if you want to perform way more conditions before you reach the else branch so maybe you want to say if this is true then if you want to try something else something else something else until you reach this condition well we have the else so else and then if just like that and in here we add the curly brackets as usual and with this in here we can have an expression so let's say that we want to say that n is or n1 equals to 100, for example, right? So we could do that and then perform something else in here, right? If we want to check another condition, you could re keep on repeating this. So else if maybe 200, so on and so forth. And you can see that the general idea is that you have one if as many else ifs and then an optional else in here so if else if else if and then else and this is pretty much the construct for if statements now there's something that i want to talk to you and that is that the if is not really a statement but is more an expression let me show you why
Cool. Let me teach you something with Kotlin. And that is that if in here, so the if statement is not a statement, but it's an expression. So even though that I said if statement is so that you can resemble with other languages, because Java, they call it as if statement, JavaScript, Golang, you call them as if statements, right? Now, the reason why they are called expressions is because they can return a value. So in here, let's say that instead of me printing the value like so, so print ln the happy face or else the sad face, what I can do is I can just remove. So actually, let me just comment this for now here. So I want you to see something. So if I comment this in here, so this line, and here I can just basically add the happy face. And also here I can add the sad face. So what is this doing? Well, this is basically returning. So return the value of this string right here, right? So this string or number or anything else. So which means that this actually is not needed. And by default, now, this whole expression, so this if expression, returns the value. So here, I can say val, and then I can say value equals to. So you can see that now, I'm storing the value happy face or sad face, and I can print it right here. So I can just say print ln and then the value, right? So hopefully now you can see how this is an expression. So if I run this main method in here, so right click and then run, and you should see that now we have the happy face, hooray, which is the same thing that you saw in here, right? So here, uh, the beauty of this actually is that you can basically have any logic, so any code in here, and whatever comes last is what you return from this expression, okay? So here, even though, so let's just remove that and uh, say true in here, and let's just change this to false, right? So even though if I run this, we should see true, right? So true and then the happy face, you know, here I'm printing. Here I'm printing, but then whatever comes last is the return value of this expression. So this is pretty much why if is an expression instead of a statement because of this return value. Awesome. So hopefully you know uh, exactly what are the differences. And let me show you the else branch here. So if we change this to an and in here, so basically it's greater than n2 and also less or equal to 30. Now this should be false and we get false and the sad face. And also this code, which is outside of the if expression, always evaluates basically this one in here. Awesome. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. In Java, we have something called the ternary operator, which basically goes like this. So if we want to assign a variable to base of a condition where we have only an if and then an else statement, we could say var and then result equals to and then the condition. So let's just say that this, let's just keep it nice and simple. So we say, well, if n1 is greater or equal to n2, then we have a value. So in our case, let's just say the happy face. Otherwise, so otherwise, we have the sad face, just like this. So this is when you have scenarios with one if and else, and that's it. Usually, if you can have more, so if, else, if, but I don't recommend you to do that. So in cases where your if and else in here, they are so simple and you're just returning one value, there's not much logic inside, literally it's just a value that you're returning. So what you can do instead is, 
So obviously in Kotlin, these are expressions, right? So the if is an expression. So what you do is, let me just comment this out and duplicate and comment. So in Kotlin is like this. You say if, and then your expression, just like that. And then you remove the question mark right here. And instead of the colon, you just say else. So this is the exact same thing as the tenery in Java, right? So let me just say R for results. So everything is smaller in here. Oops, R in here. So you can see how uh, different this is, right? So you just basically use the if, as you've seen before. If this is the case, this is true. This is the value. Otherwise, sad face, right? So if I was to print in here, uh, let me just say V for value instead, actually. So if I was to print, so print ln and then V. So let's just run this. There we go. We've got a happy face. If n1 in here, so n1 is less than n2, let's just say 19, and then run, we get the sad face. Now, obviously, we can expand this right here. So maybe you want to have another else if in here. So what do you do? Well, we can, let me just put this on a new line, but basically we could, so I'm gonna duplicate this, and this could be val actually, val, and in Java there's no val, there's var. So if you want to have else if inside of this expression, what you do is the following. So let me just duplicate this, and this I'm gonna call it v, and then one, and let's just put this on a new line, and then here on a new line. And what we could do is we could say in between if and then else in here, the expression. So let's just say that n is equal to 100, for example, n1. Then we give the value. So the value would be hooray. And this should be else if, my bad. So in here, else if. And there we go. So you can see how this is clean and beautiful code, right? And you can combine uh, multiple of these right here, but I'll just leave it uh, with one. So if you want a, a second one, for example, just duplicate this line and you could add 200, for example, hooray, and then 200, something like that, right? And now you can see that if you're just returning one value, you could just use like the ternary operator in Java, but way more improved. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. Let's look into the when expression with Kotlin. So in Java, we have this switch. So switch statement where we can switch upon a value. So we say value in here. And within that switch statement, we have cases and within cases, then we have to say break. And within that, then we can basically return a value or we could just perform something, right? Now in Kotlin, what we have is the when statement. So it can be used as a statement or as an expression. So in here, let's say that we have val and let's just represent gender in here. And let's just say F for female, okay? Now, we can say when, and the value, so we can say gender in here, so when, and then here we can define the possible outcomes. So here, say F, so basically if the value is F, then have this arrow, so minus sign, and then the greater sign, then here we can print. So let's just print female. If it's a male, so if it's M in here, we can basically say print and then male.
and we also have the default so we can say else in here and within the else statement we also need the error and inside we can say print and then unknown unknown and then gender for example just like this now if we run this what we should get is female right so because if this is equal to f we print line female if m we print male otherwise unknown so if i was to say for example this this is not a valid gender so it says unknown gender cool so this right here is the when statement this can also be used as an expression meaning that we can return a value from it so if you want to store the actual so here let me just say val and then i'm going to give it a name so g let's just say g for gender and then i can say equals to and from now on this now is an expression because this now returns so it returns a value so we can get rid of the print lines all together just like that so in here we get rid of all of that and now the value of g contains female male or gender in here so if i print so let's just print line and then g in here and let's just change this to input and then i want to say input and this will be gender so much better and now if we print gender so you can see that we store that inside of a variable unknown gender if we pass in here m and in here you can see that we have male and this is pretty much the gist of the when statement so use when when you have multiple branches and it's very similar to the switch statement in java cool and always remember so if it returns a value it's an expression otherwise if you don't return a value from it it's just a statement this is pretty much it catch me on the next one cool let me go over a few other things that you can do with the when expression you saw that in here we have the if else if else if and an else statement so what you can do is you can actually replace all of this with the when expression so if you want to replace this with when expression you do basically when and basically you add nothing inside in here and you basically have your conditions right so here this we take this and then come back paste it here and we need parentheses and add the error and then you can perform whatever you want so in our case what did you do yeah so we just printed this right here like so and you can see that now we've switched that from an if else to the when so similarly if you want to have a second case you can have the second case like so so here it doesn't really matter so n and then equals to 200 or 100 for example then you can do whatever so print and then foo right and then at the end we also have the else and basically oops not like that but have the error and basically here we can print and then the sad face so obviously you can repeat this as many times as you want and you can see that you go from if to when which is kind of neat right then the other thing that we can also do so let me just add a comment here so if else to when expression so the other thing is so we'll talk about ranges later but if we have for example a value and let's just say h 
and let's say that h in here equals to 18. So what we can do is we can say, right, so when, and then here, this time we're going to pass h, and we're going to say, right, so if h is in, and then some range, right? So if h is in between, let's say 13, and then dot, dot, and 19, for example, in here, if this is the case, right, we can execute something. So we can say print ln and then teenager, teenager, right? And we can keep on combining these, right? So it will check the first one. And then if you want, you can negate this, you can say not in, and then you can provide a range, right? So zero, for example, to all the way to 12, for example, then you can do something, right? So print line, for example. Or if you want, you can also have the else in here. And you can perform something within the curly brackets. Or if you just want to print, for example, you could just do it. But you can see that this when statement is actually way more powerful than we thought. Cool. So I'm going to leave it here for the when statement. And as we go through our journey in terms of learning Kotlin, you will see the when expression in action. But just remember that it's very powerful. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. Cool. Early on, you've learned about the Boolean and what it is. And you saw that also that with Booleans, you have three possible values. So you can have a Boolean. So here, if I say val, and then let's just say is and then adult. And then here I can say equals to false, true. Or if I want this to be nullable in here, this is possible, right? Now, obviously, when it comes to performing these checks, whether the Boolean is equal to true or not, so more often, so what you do is uh, you'd say if, and then is adult in here. And you can see that this right here, it says that, oops, sorry. So basically, we need to actually add equals equals to true. But I'll explain this in a second. So if this is false in here, this works. If this is true, this also works. But when you have your Boolean as null in here, it is necessary for us to perform. So if your Boolean can be null in here, so if we say, right, so the data type of this is, and then Boolean, right? So if we say that this in here can be null, so what we need to do is we need to perform the actual check. So if it's equals to true in here, and you know, in Java, for example, this is redundant, where you just have if and then your actual Boolean. But in Kotlin, if it's null, this is the way to do it. If equals equals true, that means that the value itself is not null and is true. Otherwise, so otherwise in here, so if I say else, so in here, I can say print line and I can say false or no. So here, let me just say print line. And I'm going to say not null and true. So if I run this in here, so let's just run this, you should see that we have in a second force or no, there we go, false or no. If I change this to, let's say true. So this now is uh, irrelevant. So let's just run this you should see that not null and true, right? Which is true. And um, as I said, if you know that for a fact that your Boolean will never be null, no need for that. And also this check here is redundant. If adult equals equals to true, this can just be that, okay? But really what I wanted to teach you is the fact that when Booleans are null, you have to perform this check. In this section, let's learn about arrays and lists. 
So far, you've seen that if you want to store a value, for example, a string, you can basically say var name or val in here. And basically, you can define the type or not. So this is a string and this allows you to store a sequence of characters. But the issue is that this verb or here called name can only store the value Jamila. What about if you want to store, for example, Jamila, you want to store, for example, Jamas, or maybe some other value. Now, obviously, we can do this under a string, but this is not the right approach. So in this section, let's learn how to properly work with arrays and lists. And also later, we'll learn the constructs that allows us to iterate through arrays and lists. Awesome. Catch me on the next one. Let us first understand arrays and then we'll look into lists, which is a better implementation of arrays. So if I want to store the value Jamila and Gemma's under a data type that allows us to store multiple values, we're going to use arrays. So here, what I'm going to do is let me just comment this for now. So I'm going to comment this like so. And what we're going to do is I'm going to say val in here. And then instead of name, I'm going to say names equals to. And at this point, we can use the array of. So this right here allows us to create an array. And when we say array of here, we can pass the values. So here I'm going to say Jamila. And let's also say Jamas, for example. Now, this here is slightly different than this string because here we have the first value and then here we have the second value. Whereas here we only have one value, which is separated by a comma. And this is the construct of creating an array. Now, we can also define the type for our array in here. And uh, this has to do with generics, which we'll kind of cover later. But for now, let's just keep things as is. But essentially, in a nutshell, if, for example, so here, let me just put this on a new line, just like that. So if I was to have, for example, here, number two, you can see that my array accepts number two. Now, if I want to prevent this from happening, I can basically say array of, and then here I can define the type. So have the less sign and greater sign. And then here we can specify the data type that we only want this array to store. So in our case, strings. If you want integers, you can say int. If you want doubles, you can say double, right? So here, if we say string number two in here, you can see that we have a compilation error. So we cannot store number two in here. And if we only have strings, you can see that this becomes redundant and we can get rid of it just like that. Cool. Now, if I was to print, so let's just print names in here, right click, run. You can see that we have this random string in here. And uh, by default, if you want to print an array, you have to do a little bit more work. And then right after names, you can say dot content to and then string. So this is a method function and we'll cover these later. But if I run this, you should see that now we have Jamila and then jammers in here. Now, one thing to bear in mind with arrays is that these are stored in what's called indexes. So this is the first index. So this right here is the zero index, one index, so on and so forth. So if I, for example, wanted to get hold of the first index, I would say in here, print 
and then names and then square brackets zero so the zero index corresponds to Jamila in here then the one index in here so one index corresponds to Jamas if I was to have for example Sami in here so this would be index number two so if I basically duplicate that index number two run and you can see that we have Jamila Jamas and then Sami what about if I try to access so if I try to access index number and then three for example so index number three so here if I run this we should get an error and the error is in here array out of bound so array index out of bound exception because basically there's nothing at index three which is empty cool so let me just basically comment this out in here and these are arrays in a nutshell now obviously if you want to change for example Jamila in here so if you want to change the name of Jamila right so here you can say names and then the index which is zero and here I can say equals to and then a different name so let's say Samira for example so this now will print Jamila and the names zero Samira will replace the content of the first index in here and if I run this you can see that initially it was Jamila but then we change it to Samira cool also in here if I hide this if you wanted to know for example the size of how many elements you have you can basically in here let's just right at the end we can say print ln and then names dot and then size so this will give us the number of size if I print we should have three inside have a look three elements inside and um, if I was to remove and if I was to add one more we would get four so on and so forth also one other thing that I want to show you is if I want to check whether so let's just say whether a particular name is within the array so we could for example use if in here and then we could have the string that we're looking for so here let's just say hello and then we can say in names so if this is the case i'm going to say print and then found for example otherwise not found there we go not and then found so if I was to run this we should get not found have a look not found but if I for example try and search for Jamas in here so Jamas is Jamas in names you can see that it's found so this is one way that we can use the in keyword to check whether something exists within the array and one last thing that I want to emphasize with arrays is that once you define the array itself you are no longer able to resize so the size of this array right here it's three and cannot be expanded nor shrinked cool next let's continue to explore arrays Cool. So you've seen how to work with arrays, you've seen indexes, you've seen size, also you've seen the in keyword or the in operator and um, also how to print the array to string because otherwise you get a funny character. Also, what I want to quickly show you is that this is one of many ways of creating arrays. So if I scroll down in here and let's basically add a comment like that. So in here, if I say array, 
So you can see that we have a bunch of constructs, so array of, so you've seen this array of nulls. So this will initialize an array of, so let's say that we want to store strings, for example. And then we also have to pass the size, how many elements that we want to store in here. And this right here, so array of nulls. So let me just put this on a new line like that. So the array now in here contains five spaces and all of them are null. So if I show you, so if I say print ln array of nulls dot, and remember the method content to string. So if we just run this, you can see that we have null, 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 null. Now, obviously, you've seen that if I want to change, so array of nulls, and then here, let's just change the position three, for example, or four, two, and then hello, for example, and let's just bring this right at the end, run it. You can see that we have hello right at the end, okay? So, Basically, this is how you create an array full of nulls and then basically act upon it. Also, if you want to create arrays, so I can say array and have a look. You can have Boolean arrays, byte arrays. You can have double, so empty array. So basically, I think it's the same thing. So empty, oops, or actually array in here. And I think maybe this is the same as the array of nulls. I think that's the same thing. And double array, float, int, and I will look. So you've got all of these constructs that allows you to create arrays. Now, obviously, also, if you want to create an array of numbers, for example, you can say int, and then have a look, array of. So this will basically be an array of integers instead of string. And I think you have uh, also double array of and other data types. But basically, this is pretty much what I wanted to cover about arrays. And you can do a lot more things in terms of initializing the array. So for example, if I wanted to, so this array of nulls, if I want to fill the array in here, right? So let's say that I want to fill the array with stars, for example. You can say array of nulls dot, and then you can use these methods. So have a look. So you can fill, you can say plus element require nulls. You can reverse, you can shuffle, you can slice for each, which you'll learn later. And then any as well. So there's a bunch of these methods that we can use, including count as well, filtering, flat map. So this is more advanced is empty so in here you can basically say fill in here and we want to fill the array with stars for example so if i run this instead of nulls it will have stars all the way and then hello because of this line in here cool so We'll leave it here for arrays and uh, arrays is a very important data structure that you should know how to use. And what we need to cover later is how to iterate through arrays. But this is pretty much it. Next, let's cover lists. Cool, you've seen arrays, now let's work with lists. So the difference between arrays and lists is that lists are expandable. Whereas with arrays, once you define the size, you are no longer able to expand its size. So if you want to create a list, it goes like this. You can say val, and then I'm going to say list in here, and then colon, and we can define the type if we want. So here we can say string. So this is a list of string. And here we can say list equals to and then list. And it basically uh, works the same as arrays. So you saw in here, 
it was array of so in here and here we have list and then of so you can say list of and then have the size if you want to have an empty list you can say empty list in here and we'll cover mutable list in a second so if i say list of in here and i'm going to add a new line and now i can add my items so here let's just say again jamila and comma we can say jamas for example comma we can say sale and in here let's just say jamas and um, in here let's also say peter for example cool and let me uppercase jamila in here so now let me actually also change this to names so we have names that contains in here four items now if i was to let's just again say print line and names so right click run and this time we actually get the list printed instead of the funny sequence of characters so you can see that we have jamila jama Sale, and peter so if you want to in here access for example the first element you can basically say print line and then names dot and here we can basically grab the index so i can say like this so the same way that we've done with the race we can do it so zero is the zero index we have jamila if you want to use the dot so there's a dot get in here we can also use it but you can see that intellij says that we should use the index operator if you want to know the size in here let's just duplicate this you can say names dot and then size so if i run this you can see that we have four elements so one two three and then four and from this point onwards it kind of works the exact same thing as arrays because lists are built on top of arrays and if i want to know whether peter is there so i can say print line in here and then names dot contains and here i can say peter so if i run this you can see that this will give us true and if i basically say it contains foo in here run it we should get false and you've probably seen that contains has contains all as well so basically you can pass a list of elements and check whether they all exist in the list and um, this is it now what about if you want to add a new element so this is the difference between a list and arrays so lists are expandable whereas arrays are not and also if you want to omit this altogether you can right so you could just do this so i'm just showing the types actually cool so to add a new element so in here we need to say names dot and here we have an add method and um, basically this will not work and that's because this list right here so this list is a read only list of given elements so if you want to add a new item you need to use a different construct and that's what we're going to learn next but in a chill so obviously there's uh, more methods that you can explore in here so i can say print line and then names dot and if you want just go through all of these methods and basically just read the documentation on what they do but for example we have first if i want to find out the first element run this and we get jamila she's the first also there's a last so here you can see that we get peter if you want the index so in here names dot index of let's just say sale for example run it 
So Saleh is 0, 1, and then 2. So we should get 2. There we go. And this is pretty much how you work with lists. Now, bear in mind that this is a read-only list, which means that you cannot add new elements. Let me actually show you what you have to do next. Cool. So if you want to be able to add new elements to lists, you need to use in here mutable list of. So this in here gives us the flexibility. So here we can say string. And obviously this is optional. So let me just remove it. So in here now, when we change this from list of to mutable list, it just says by the name mutate so it means that we can now add in here and remove as well so very important add and remove so in here let's just leave all these operations uh, as they were and um, so let's have a look in here so if i wanted to for example remove sally for example so you can say in here names dot and then remove and then in here we can remove first we can remove last we can remove if as well with a filter but let's just say remove and then sally now if i print lists so let me just duplicate this and then print it right here at the end run it and now you can see that we have Jamila, Jama, Saleh, and Peter. Then in here, I said names that remove Saleh, and now Saleh is gone. Cool. So what about if I want to add a new element? So I can just say names dot and then add. So you can see that this time the add method works because this is a mutable list. So we have a couple of options we can add. So in here, you can see that we can pass the index or we could just add it right at the end and you can see we can also add a collection so let's just say add in here and let's just add for example alex now if i print names so let's just duplicate change the line run this and you can see that now we have alex and this is the beauty of mutable lists right so basically it's also built on top of arrays but the beauty is that you can add and delete elements from the array now you might be asking right so when should i use mutable list versus uh, a list or array so most of the times you're going to be using mutable lists or read only lists and then the decision that you have to make is right so do i need to add and remove elements if so just use mutable lists otherwise just use read only lists and from this point onwards all the methods are the same so here let me just say print ln and i can say names dot and have a look last first we can replace as well we can remove we can set we can get by an index remove if so this is to do with streams and you can check whether it's empty right so is names for example is empty right the array itself so if i run this this will give us false so it's not empty because it has four elements inside okay so if i was to create so in here let's just say print line and then mutable and then list of and then let me just take this and put it into a variable in here empty and then list and here we could just say any so remember the any type which means that you can store any data type you want so let's just run this and you can see that this is empty and if i invoke dot and then empty in here or is empty run it you can see that this time it's true whereas before 
in here so this names right here is not empty because it contains elements and to be honest this is pretty much it next let me talk to you about data types and that is very important when it comes to arrays and lists catch me on the next one Cool. Let me teach you about the destructuring declaration when working with lists, arrays, and pretty much any collection. So if we want to grab Jamila, Jamus, and uh, Sally, for example, under one variable, we would typically do this in many languages. So here we can say val, and then I can say j for Jamila, for example, equals to, and then names, and you've seen the index, right? Now let's basically get Jamas. So I'm gonna say J A. And here Jamas is at position one. And then Sally, I'm gonna say just S. And Sally's at position two, right? Now this here is cumbersome and never do this in languages such as Kotlin and JavaScript. So what we can do is we can turn the following. So we can turn this into this. So here, let me just put a comment. So what we can do is we can say val and then open parenthesis. And I'm going to add a comment here, basically comment all of this. So you have reference in here, just like that. And now I can grab the values in order. So here I can basically assign this to a variable. So I'm going to say J, for example, or let's just say one two and then three equals two and then names so what this is doing is basically destructuring the values for us so have a look so one now will be jamila two will be jamas three will be sally cool so if i was to print for example let's just say print ln and then one and uh, let's actually print everything in the under one line. So here dollar sign and then one dollar sign and then two and finally dollar sign and three. All right. So if we run this, have a look, Jamila, Jamas and Sally. So if you omit in here, so I think we can even omit. So basically, if you don't want to pull, for example, Sally, but you want to pull Peter, for example, right, which is the fourth. So I'm going to say four, for example, so four. So now we are skipping, right? So we skip Sally. And if I run this, you can see that we have Peter. Now, let's actually check whether this is actually variable. So if I was to say underscore, yes. So basically underscore, we can't really reference to underscore because this is how we skip a value. So this is kind of nice and uh, one that you should really be aware. So here, this works with lists of, array of, so any collection really. Cool. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. Whether you are working with mutable lists, arrays, or regular lists, never mix types. So here, never, for example, have a list that contains strings and then numbers and then doubles in here. So basically never do this, okay? Because if you start doing this, it's going to be very difficult for you to build applications and you're going to have to write a lot of code to accommodate different data types. So usually this is a big no, no. And hence, sometimes you've seen in here. So if I say only strings, so basically when you say in here, less sign and then add the data type inside that you want and then close. So this has to do with generics. You can see that I'm no longer able to add numbers in here. Right. So obviously, if I remove this, 
then the IDE knows that I'm only working with strings, then it tells me, right, so this is not needed and I'm safe. So if you do this, you will encounter lots of issues, potential bugs, and you don't want to mix data types when working with lists. And I can guarantee you that you will never mix, even if you feel like, oh, but I, I think I might have to mix data types. Trust me, you will not mix. So it's the same thing with, for example, a pencil case, right? So pencil case, you can only store pencils, for example. Now, obviously you could have different types of pencils, but they are pencils. So you wouldn't store, for example, a spoon <laughs> within your pencil case or your socks or literally any other data type. So socks, spoon, these are data types within the pencil case. So with programming is the same thing. And as you write larger applications, you'll see that what I'm saying does make sense. Cool. So I felt like I had to put emphasis on this point. So never mix data types when working with any data structure. All right. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. In the previous session, you saw how to work with arrays and lists. Now let's learn how to use loops effectively to loop through them. And also I'll show you some of the cool things that we can do with loops. So in here, I do have two collections. So the first one is a list names and the other one is an array of integers. So here, let's say that we want to loop through them, right? So you saw that. If you want to access, for example, so if I say print Ellen, if I want to get, for example, Mary in here, I could just say names and then the index. If I want to get Ali, names and then one. If I want to get Alex, names and then two. So this is the first index, which is this one. So basically this is the zero index, one index and then two index. And if I say three, we get arrays out of bounds here because there's no element at index three in here. And you can even see that um, basically IntelliJ is telling me index is always out of bounds because it knows. Cool. But this is not a good approach when we want to basically get all the values. So for that, we can use loops. So if we want to loop through the list of names, we can use the for construct. So for goes like this, you say for and then you have a temporary variable. So here I can just call it name in and then the collection. So in our case, names. So what this will do now, so here we can also add curly brackets. And basically now we are within this block where we can do pretty much anything that we want with each element. So the first iteration name will be Mary. Second iteration name will be Ali third iteration name will be Alex. So if I was to say print Ellen and then name in here, let's run this. There we go. So if I put this bigger, you can see that we have Mary, Ali and Alex. Cool. So this is the four construct. So let's also print numbers. So let me just add a new line. So let's just say four and then number. And then in here we can say in and then numbers. So also if you are just executing one line of code in here, there's no need for curly brackets. You could just say print LN and then number. Now, one thing that I want to tell you is that so here, so this is a variable name. So this could be n, for example, right? So this, I usually basically just say if I have something called numbers or transactions, I always have the singular. So transaction, number, name instead of names, right? So I always have the singular of the variable name. Cool. So if I run this, we should see that we have one, two, three, four, five 
basically five numbers that we have in here, right? And uh, the loop basically knows when to start and when to stop. And um, this is pretty much the way that you loop with Kotlin. Now in here, let's say that within this for loop, we have each name in here. So each name, Mary, Ali, and Alex. And we want to capitalize the first letter of each name. So M should be capital M, capital A, and capital A for Alex. So what we can do is in here, so let's just basically say name dot, and then we can say replace first, and then character in here. And uh, basically this takes a character, so it's a lambda expression, and we'll learn more about lambda expressions later, but here I can say it dot and then uppercase. So basically this right here will replace the first character to uppercase and the result in here, I'm just gonna call it n for now. I'm gonna say val n equals to and then basically this now will be the replaced. So it will be marry with capital like that. So in here, I can now say print and then N instead of the original name that we get. Cool. So let's just run this. And if I scroll up, have a look. Mary, Ali and Alex. Each of the first letters or the first characters are now in uppercase. Cool. So this is a quick introduction on how to use loops. Let me teach you about indices because sometimes what you want really is to get the index instead of the actual value and then you can perform other operations. So in here, let's change this from an array of instead of numbers. And let's just, for example, have characters. So we could actually, I think we have car array of. So here, let's just change this from A, B, and then C. And let me just put this on a new line like that. D and then E. Cool. So now this is C. I'm going to rename this. So C in and then let's just say letters in here. And I'm going to say L or you can say letter in and then letters and then print the letter itself. Right. So if I run this in here, you can see that we have a, B, C, D, E. Now, if I want to grab the index instead, what we can do is let's just put this inside of curly brackets so that we have more space. So here I can say dot and then indices. So what this will give me now, so I'm going to say index instead of letter. And if I print the index, now if I run this, have a look we get the index 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the index is basically the position. So 0 index, 1 index, 2, 3, and then 4. Now, if you want to grab the values themselves, so let's just do this. Let's just print the index. So we're going to add this within double quotes. And then here, I'm going to have the index. So here, index followed by so in here, I'm going to say comma, and I want to grab. So I'm going to have dollar sign and then curly brackets. And here I'm going to say letters followed by the index. So hopefully now you see how this is playing together. So as I'm looping, I'm going to go to letters. So this is my character array and the index will be passed inside here. So the first time is going to be zero, one, two, three, four. So if I run it, there we go. You see that we have zero A, one B, and then two C, three D, four E. Cool. So the cool thing with 
this also is if you want to print in reverse right so if you want to print in reverse what we can do is the following so we can take this and let me just say print ln and then reverse and i'm going to paste the exact same code and now what i can do is i can say dot so right after i say letters dot indices dot and then reversed so this will now reverse and the index will start from the end instead of the start so here if i run this so have a look so when we reverse now it starts from four three two one and then zero awesome so this is pretty much how you use the indices when it comes to arrays now obviously this could be a list as well so here if i say list of right so list of you can see that this will still work so it doesn't really matter whether it's a character array or any other data type or basically whether it's a mutable list it will just work so that's the beauty of kotlin cool so let me just stick with character array in here and this is pretty much it for this video catch me on the next one with loops we have a concept of range and it goes like this so if i have a for loop and i want to print a particular range meaning that let's say from numbers 1 to 10 for example we can say for i in and usually you see that here this is where we pass the list or the array but with ranges we can say right so we can give it a range so this is an integer so one between so dot dot and then the end so here let's just say one to five and this is intellij telling us the actual range now if i print this let me just print it like this so print and then i in here so if i run this you can see that we have numbers one all the way to five so if you want maybe um 10 to 100 for example you can do it so if i just run it we should see all the numbers from 10 all the way to 100. cool so let me just stick with small numbers and this is nice what we can also do is we can print in reverse so if i say four and then i in and in here five and then dot dot and then one in here so what i want to do first is i want to show you that if i try to do this and run this in here we get nothing and that's because if you want to print in reverse all we do is you don't say dot dot but instead you say down and then two so five down two and then whatever the stop number that you want so if i run this time you can see that we do get five four three two and then one awesome so this is pretty much ranges and one other cool thing that we can do is so let me just duplicate this right here so if you want to step so we can actually use the step and basically we can step right so the default is one but we can step in twos so one to five but we're going to step every second element so if i just so in here let's just have print line and then i'm going to say steps so that we basically have a nice output so also print line and then here down two and here i'm just going to say print line and then range all right cool so let me just comment this one for now so we can have a better output so if i run this 
have a look. So we have steps, but have a look. We have one, and then we step from one to three. So this is, we're stepping in twos. So we have one, and then we're stepping in twos. One, three, and then five. So you can see, this is beautiful. Also, if you want to, you can basically step in here. So step, and then we can say step, and then two as well and coming down right so five and then three and then one so if i run this you can see five three and then one and this is pretty much it so let me just say steps or step and then down in here Cool, so this is how you use for loops and range as well as the down to as well as step to have control on how you iterate. If you have any questions, drop me a message. Otherwise, catch me on the next one. You saw that you can loop with lists and arrays, but also if you have a string in here, you can loop through a string as well. So it's the exact same thing. And let me show you something. You can say brand dot. And then if you say F O or, and then if you say four, IntelliJ auto completes this for us, right? So here I'm going to say the letter in brand and I'm going to print L and then obviously you could perform anything you want right so you can have if statements and whatnot but if I right click and then run you can see that we have amigos code in here and then here as well obviously if you want to use the indices so dot and then indices dot and then reverse basically you could use everything that we've learned so far but I just thought that I would let you know that you can also loop through a sequence of characters. Another way that we can loop is using the for each construct. And this is found in many languages, including Java, JavaScript, and Kotlin also has it, of course. So if you want to loop, you've seen that you can say for, or you can use IntelliJ auto completion. So names and then for in here, and then we get a construct and then we can print, right? So here, let's just say print line and then name. Okay. But we can also use the for each, which is a better syntax in my opinion, and uh, one that you will use quite a lot. And if you don't need access to the indices, then this is a good approach. So you basically say, so let me just put it right above. You say names dot, so your collection, and then for each. So for each takes a consumer in here, and then inside we can add curly brackets, and here we have access to IT. So IT is a placeholder that corresponds to the value for each element. So now I can just say print LN and then IT, just like that. So you can see that also IntelliJ says that move Lambda argument out of parentheses and we don't actually need, you know, parentheses. So we could just do it like this which is much better. Have a look. So names for each and then curly brackets. And then you basically say print LN. And obviously if you want uh, to have multi lines, just like that. And you can see IntelliJ is actually even telling you the data type for IT. So this is quite cool. So this is the exact same thing as this in here. So let me just comment this out. So it doesn't execute. Let's right click run and have a look we have jamila jama saleh peter so literally just use any array and uh, just use the for each and uh, you can see that it's quite neat cool
there's more to it when it comes to functional programming which we'll cover later but for now this is pretty much everything about the for each construct Cool. Another construct that allows us to loop is the while and do while loops. So let me show you. And uh, if you've done Java, then this is pretty much the exact same thing. And let's say that we have a variable in here. I'm going to call it I and we're going to oh, actually let's just call it number equals to one in here. And let's say that we want to loop through while the number is less or equal than five and then print and also increment the number so the way we do it is using the while construct and here this is an expression right so i'm going to say while number is less or equal to five in here so if this is the case right i want to print the number so i'm going to say print line and then i'm going to say number and then here dollar sign and then the number itself and obviously here i need to increment number so i'm going to say plus plus and then number cool so if i run this right click run you can see that we have number one two three four five so basically this um is from one to five but if you want the reverse right so from five so five all the way down to zero you say five and then basically you reverse so while number is greater or equal to zero and here we're going to decrement so minus minus and then number run this and you can see that we have five four three two one and then zero Cool. So this is the while loop. And obviously, if you have a given array, you can actually loop through the array as well. So if we have a real list, basically. So if we have, for example, in here, let's just uh, have a, a string. Let's just have a string. So here, I'm going to say brand and then equals to and then amigos code. So this will be val. And here, I'm going to have the index, so var and then index equals to and then brand dot and then length minus one right because the length is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten right but the index is from zero right so zero to nine so this is me looping from top to bottom right if you want the reverse you just say zero so zero from here and then moving forward but i'll show you in a second so here if i now say that the index so the index so while index is greater or equal to zero in here i'm going to say index minus minus so decrement the index and then here i'm going to print brand and then index so brand and then index and index can't type today and obviously i need to have curly brackets because it's not just a variable but it's a more complex operation in here right cool so if i run this you can see that basically e d o basically amigos code in reverse if you want from beginning to end, you just change this from this to zero. And let's actually take this instead and just reverse. So just like that. And then obviously we have to change the sign. So this is now less or equal. And then here we increment the index plus plus and then index run this. And now, oops, it shouldn't be number, <laughs> but it should be um let's just print like that right so it should be that so if i just run it there we go so you can see amigos code so this is pretty much how you use the while loop and obviously i said this could also be for example so we can change this from array 
of and here I'm just going to say a uh, and then M I so basically amigos but I'm gonna leave it here and here instead of length this is size and in here so this is brand instead and we can remove the necessary string template and if I run this we should have Ami <laughs> should be amigos code but you get the gist cool so this is how you use the while loop and obviously remember the difference between val and var so the reason why I'm saying var in here is because here I'm reassigning the value of index so if I say val in here this will not work cool this is pretty much it catch me on the next one Okie dokie, you've seen the while loop, which basically works like this. And here, if I say, for example, true. So this is the Boolean expression that it takes, right? So while this is true, if I print in here, so if I say hello, so this will actually print forever. Okay, let me just try so you can see. So you can see that this is actually printing forever and let me kill the process by pressing the stop button and there we go. So basically if I change this to false in here and run this, this will never print nothing. Now, if you want something to be done at least once and then continue the operation while your condition is true, what you can do is you can say do and then while so now all of this goes so the body in here has to go and it goes like this right so do something so here we want to print while a condition so in our case before you saw that while false and then inside of the body nothing gets printed but now if i run this so i've just indented things so do this first while false so no matter what this will always be printed or executed at least once. So if I run this, you can see that we have hello once. And if I change this to true in here, this will run forever. So let me just stop this and you can see that it's running. And basically, if you want to perform something at least once and then have your condition, then use the while loop. Cool. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. Cool. Now let's learn about the break and continue keywords. So let's say that we want to skip the number two while looping. So here, let's just say four and then n in nums. And let's say while we are looping, if the number equals to two, we want to continue, i.e. we want to skip. So here, let's just say print, and we're going to print n for now. And if I run this, you should see that we have one, two, three, four, five, nice and easy. So if I wanna skip number two and not print it, I can say if, and n equals to two, then inside here, I can say continue. Now what this does, it basically, if this condition is met, continue was simply skip whatever comes, so whatever line comes after line six, and then go back to the next iteration. So if I run this, we should skip number two. So you can see that one and we went to three instead. Let's say that you want to change this so that if the number is even, you want to skip it. So you can say if n and then modulus and then two equals equals zero. So if there's no remainder, then we know that the number is even. So if we run it, you can see that now we are only printing odd numbers. So one, three, five. 
So if you want the reverse, you could just say not equal and then run it. And you can see that now we are only printing even numbers. So this is the continue keyword. Now let's say that. So in here, we also have, you know, six, seven, eight, and even more numbers. And as soon as the number, so as soon as the number is bigger than five, we want to come out of the loop altogether. So for that, we can use the break keyword. So here, let's just say if, and then n greater than five, we want to break. So break, and obviously we can basically have curly brackets in here and then just say break, or you could just leave it like this. So it really depends on the formatting style that you and your team decide. So now if the number is greater than six, we don't even want to go back to the next iteration, but we want to come out of this loop altogether in here, right? So let me just say print ln some other code. So if I run this, you can see that we only print two, four, and then six, and uh, we continue to some other code. Now, obviously here I said six and I meant five, my bad. So this is five, not six, but five. So we should print even numbers up to five, right? So two and four. And then as soon as the number is bigger than five, we skip all of this by coming out of the loop. So let's just run it once more. And there we go. And this is pretty much how you use the break and continue. Now, one thing to bear in mind is, so I'm gonna quickly show you that, if I have in here, so nums dot for each, and if you think that you can use the break and continue inside, you are wrong. So if I say it, so if it equals to two, for example, in here, I want to continue. So if I say continue, so this is not possible. Have a look. So break and continue are only allowed inside a loop. So this is also a loop, but it is slightly different. And uh, we'll explore the functional programming style later. But also if I want to break out of this loop in here, if I want to break out of this loop, I'm not allowed. And it's the same thing with Java. Cool. So let me just say this is not allowed. And let me have a multi-line common in here. So just like that. And then end it right here. Okie dokie. This is pretty much everything for break and continue. That's all for now. Catch me on the next one. In this section, let's focus on functions and functions. Basically, it's what makes a program in general. So if you have an application and you want to perform a bunch of business logic, i.e. all this, all the decision making, all the steps required in order for you to build a large piece of your application, functions is the heart of pretty much everything. Now, in Kotlin, this is a function in here. So you've seen that when we have basically print line, hello in here. So fun and then main. So this is the construct for creating a function. This is the name. So this is a special name because this is the entry point for our application. And then here, this is how we are invoking the function. And then within it, we have the parentheses and then followed by curly brackets. And inside, this is the function body. Now here you see that the function name is called main. And inside I have a sequence of instructions. So in my case, print ln. Print ln as well. So if I put my mouse in here, print ln is 
another function have a look it's a function so public inline fun the name is print ln and then it receives a message of type any and the return type is unit which we'll cover in a second as well so you've seen also that in here so i can say hello but if i say hello dot and then uppercase this is also another function right so these are predefined functions or built-in functions that we can use so have a look so this is public inline fun string and then uppercase it returns a string and basically it returns a copy of this string converted to uppercase using unicode right so in programming we basically use so also you've seen that we can get for example indices right so here if i say indices so indices actually this is a variable in here but have a look i think we used replaced before so replace first car right or replace in here and then lowercase so all of these are functions so if i run this in here so let me just run this and you can see that we have hello being printed right so this is a function called print ln and inside we have something called an argument so these are the arguments so what goes into a function and uh, i'll show you basically arguments and parameters in a second so in this section let's learn how to work with functions Let's create our very first function. So in here, literally outside the main function, let's have our function that pretty much will greet. So let's just say fun. So this is the construct for creating a function. And here I'm going to say greet. So we're going to say greet. And this right here is the name of the function. And then just add parentheses. And in here have curly brackets. And this is our function. Now, inside of this function called greet, we can perform anything we want, right? So this is where we put all the business logic for our application or for what we're trying to do. So in our case, I'm simply going to say print ln, and then I'm going to say hello. So basically, let me just get rid of this print ln in here. This is our function. Now, if I want to invoke this function called greet in here, inside of this other function called main, so this is where our application runs, I can just say greet. So I just name the function in here. So just name the function, right? And if I want to execute the function, I just add parentheses. So this is actually invoking the function. If I run this, we should see that we have hello, right? So if I change this to hello, and then maybe add an emoji, and then say, hey, for example, there we go, and run this, you can see that we have hello in here. If I comment this out in here, run, this doesn't get executed. So even though we have Oh, actually, sorry, I didn't want to do this. I wanted to comment out this one in here. So even though we have a function in here, it's not being used anywhere. And even IntelliJ, it's actually graying out the function name. So as soon as I run this first, we get nothing. But if I uncomment this, now the function becomes blue and we know that it's being used. So this in here is a function. Now, if I put my mouse in here on top of this function, you can see that this says public and then fun and then greet colon and then unit. So basically I can do this. I can say public and these are part of the access modifiers and we'll learn these later. But let me just remove this because it's redundant. So by default, these functions, they are public. 
unless you want to say private in here which means that the only thing that can access this function is anything within this file in here so let's just get rid of this and not complicate things at this point and access modifiers not just work with functions but also with variables cool so in here if i put my mouse in here have a look public fun and then greet colon colon and then unit so in here if i say colon and then a unit so this is a default return type which is unit if you come from java this is the same thing as saying in here public and then void and then greet so greet in here so greet is the name of the function void it means that this function doesn't return any value so let me just get rid of this and if i press command and then you can see that i can navigate into the unit definition so let's just go into it or you can press command and b and also you can see the keyboard shortcut down below in here so in here public object unit the type with only one value the unit object this type corresponds to the void type in java all right so basically this is actually redundant so if your function doesn't return any value then basically you can omit this all together okay so you don't need this and uh, it's the same with the main function as well so i could actually say in here unit so it's the same thing but this is redundant all right so this is your first function with kotlin so fun is the keyword for creating functions then the name then here you add parentheses and inside parentheses you can have parameters so currently there's nothing right so i'll show you parameters also in a second and this is pretty much it let's carry on with functions in the next video all right now let's say that our function we want to have the ability of passing an argument into the function so when we invoke the function greet we want to pass for example the name and then we should be able to print hello and then basically the emoji and then the emoji followed by the name of the person so how do we do that well with functions we have something called parameters so in here we can have a parameter and let's just say name for example now when we say name we can't just say name because we need to specify the actual type so what is the type for the value which will be passed so here let's just say string and now you can see that this greet function here is complaining because we need to pass the name so here let's just say jamila for example so this is the name and here we not using it so if we run this so we still get hello in here but really what i want is hello and then jamila so let's just use it so here we can basically add dollar sign and then name cool so let's just run this and you can see that we have hello jamila now the beauty of this is that I can invoke the exact same function in here and I can say Alex for example and here let's just say Bob as well if I run this you can see that we have hello Jamila hello Alex hello Bob right so this is the beauty of functions now this right here is the parameter so a function can have so a function can have zero or more parameters and then the values that go inside so the values that go inside these are the arguments also just bear in mind that IntelliJ is actually adding the hint for the name of the parameter so here name colon so don't type this basically right so this is IntelliJ and I can get rid of it by pressing option and then I can say do not show hints for current method and you can see that it basically gets rid of it so let me just undo in here 
and sometimes I kind of like this and uh, it's really up to you but basically these are parameters and these are the arguments the different values that we pass so also if you want to pass for example age so let's just say comma and then we can say age and here the age is an integer right now we can basically say if and then age in here is greater or equal to let's say 16 we're going to say print and then name is an adult else we're going to say basically the same thing but I'm going to say is not an adult and now here we have to pass the age so let's just in here say comma and we can say 22 for example in here we can say also 16 and let's say that Bob is 11 cool so you can see that now we have two arguments and two parameters if I run this there we go so hello Jamila Jamila is an adult hello Alex Alex is an adult hello Bob Bob is not an adult cool so you can see that basically this function now we print we have some logic in here and if it's an adult or not we basically perform some if else statement and generally this is how we write our business logic but in this video you've learned about parameters and arguments. Cool. One other thing that I want to cover when it comes to the arguments is that in here, let's say that you want to switch, for example, first you want to pass the age and then the name, for example, you can do it. So here, what we do is we basically get rid of this for now. And now I can say age equals two and then 23 comma. And then I can say name equals two and then Jamila. So this is kind of the same thing as IntelliJ is doing, but basically here now I'm being explicit on the actual ordering that I'm passing these. So sometimes you might have, you know, a long list of arguments and you want to be able to define. So you want to say age equals to 23, name equals to Jamila, so on and so forth. You can also do it. So here, if I run this, nothing will change. So it's the exact same thing. Hello, Jamila. Jamila is an adult right and you could also do the same for these ones this is what's known as named arguments cool next let me talk to you about default arguments all right now let's learn about default values for arguments so sometimes you might not necessarily want to pass a value into a function or basically an argument. What Kotlin allows us to do, very similar to Golang and also JavaScript, is that we can have a default value. So let's say that, for example, we don't want to pass age in here. So what we can do is we can say age and then colon int equals to and then the default value. So here, let's just say minus one. So we're going to say minus one, and now we can have a bit of logic in here. So we can say, right, so if the age in here is greater or equal to 16, we print is an adult. And also let's just have another if statement in here. So let's just say if, and then age equals to minus one. So we know that age is not provided. So obviously uh, there's better ways of doing this, but this just allows me to illustrate the purpose of default arguments. So here I'm going to say print ln age 
not provided for example and what i'm going to do is um, we could actually you know exit out of this method all together by using the return keyword but let's learn that later but now it means that for example within alex in here i can remove the age altogether have a look so this is good so now alex age will be minus one because it's not provided so if we run this let me just add a print line but be between between each grid in here so print line as well or oh, actually better what we can do is so let's just remove this print line as well and we can do it right at the end of the method so let's just say print line so this is much better cool so if i run this now what we should be able to see is have a look hello jamila and then jamila is an adult hello alex and then age not provided alex is not an adult so i'll show you something else that we can do so that we don't print this line in here and then followed by bob bob is an adult so both ali so both jamila and so both jamila and bob they have age and with alex because we didn't pass age the default value is minus one and obviously if you want here as well so for the name you could have equals two and then the default um and then the default value but in our case we want name to be mandatory cool this is pretty much everything about default arguments catch me on the next one what's really cool about kotlin is that you can pass functions as arguments so functions within functions so in here, let's say that we want to have another function. Let's just say function or fun. And I'm gonna call it, and I'm gonna call this as foo in here. And within this foo function, I want to be able to pass another function as argument. So the way we do it is we can say bar, for example, this is going to have the type as this in here so this is literally a lambda function in here so it goes like bar and then basically this is a lambda function and in here we need the body just like that and now we can have some logic in here so let's just have a simple print i'm going to say bar function in here and right after it I can invoke this function, which is bar. So I'm gonna say bar in here and invoke it like so. Which means that now, if I want to use this full function, I can in here, let's just add a comment so that we basically organize things properly. And now within our main function, if I was to use the foo, so foo in here, I'm going to say foo and I've got couple of options so here i can basically invoke it like so and then say bar equals to and then curly brackets and this now is the function so here i can basically have now any logic i want so here i can say for example another print and then bar as a function cool so let's run this and um, you should see that what we get is bar function and then bar as a function i can basically now take this foo invoke it again and this time i can basically say for example baz and then baz so this right here is anything that i want right so let's just run this and you can see that now this is bar function and then baz baz. So you can see that this function has a different implementation than this one when the function is passed onto it. Now you've seen defaults. So if you don't want to pass a function, what you do is basically say equal and you can have an empty implementation like so, right? So now here 
I don't need to pass the function in here. So this is kind of cool. And the other thing is, so in here, we can basically, so let me just duplicate this in here. So we can pass the function in two ways. We can have it as named argument in here, or so we can take this in here. Let's just get rid of this like so, and we can pass it like this. Have a look. So in fact, we don't need the parentheses and this is basically invoking the full function and then passing the other function inside. So it's the exact same thing as we do in here. So if I was to run this in here and um, let's just say two, for example, run it and you can see that it works the exact same way. So in here, bar function, bar as function, and then bar function, bar as function two, and then bar function. And then here, this in here, we didn't pass any function and it just gets a default and uh, we don't do anything. So this is a really nice feature when you can pass functions within functions. And bear in mind that this right here, so in here, so this right here will only work when the function, so the function in here, so the function is the last argument. Yeah, so if it's not, then you have issues. So here, if I was to say, for example, let's just say name, and this is a string, for example, right? And let's have a default value of empty, for example. So now you can see that you are no longer able to do this, right? So you can only do this when the last, so the last argument of it is the lambda itself. So here, let's just switch places. And now you can see that this in here does work. So if this is a bit complicated, don't you worry, because as you start to write Kotlin code and do more complex stuff, then all of this becomes second nature. And one last thing that I want to mention is, so here we basically have a unit. So in here, have a look. So name and then bar. So let's just basically put this on a new line like so. So this is a unit, but this could be done any data time. So you, if you want a string, you just say string. If you want an integer, then you just say integer, right? And obviously here, then you have to return the default value as well that comes with it. But in here, you can see that this now fails because we have to return a number, for example. There we go. Cool. So let me just put it back because it's easy to understand the way I've done it. But at this point, if this is a bit confusing, don't you worry about it. Seriously. Cool. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. Let's go back to this function called greet, still under the functions.kotlin file. And in here, remember, we saw that if the age is minus one, basically it goes and prints all of this. But let's say that I don't want to continue at this point and meaning that I want to bail out. So what we can do is within the condition, so here, if and then age, right? So what we can do is just say return. Now, when I say return, it basically, everything that comes after this line in here, so line 27, will not be executed. So you saw that in here, when we have, I think it was Alex, right? So before it was printing that Alex was not an adult in here right? Because he goes in here. So Alex age is minus one, which is a default. But all I want is basically to come out of this method and not even bother to what's coming next. So this is when you use the return keyword. Let's just run this. And now if I scroll up, you should see that we have hello Jamila. Jamila is not an adult. And then 
hello alex age not provided and then we don't have basically alex is not an adult because we exited the method altogether right so here we did exit the method altogether and let's also include a new line so we can include a new line by saying backslash and then n and if i run this again so this time we should have a new line in between so here i want to have a new line in between here alex age not provided a new line and then hello bob bob is not an adult awesome this is pretty much it also what i think maybe you can include the age in here as well if you want so name and then in here let's just say age and then dash and let's just take this and put it right here and i think now we have better messaging so if we run this you can see that now we have jamila 23 is an adult alex age not provided bob 11 is not an adult cool this is pretty much the return keyword right so if i was to in here let's just write in here let's just return so if we return at this point nothing will be executed and you can see that intellij is telling me hey what's this <laughs> so if i run this you can see that nothing get executed apart from our functions within functions so this is pretty much it so what i'm going to do actually is let's just take this right here and i'm going to say functions as arguments there we go cool and you haven't learned about private so let's just remove that and here if you want to uncomment this and run it just do it all right so if i run this the output should now be less verbose have a look so nothing but all I want is within the greet, I want to get rid of this because this is pointless. All right, this is pretty much how you exit out of a method whenever you want using the return keyword. All right, so, so far you've seen that our functions, they really don't return any value, right? So you saw the, in here, the unit, so the unit type, and basically our functions, they don't return anything. So let's learn how to pretty much return a value from a function. So here, let's say that we want to have the ability of doubling a number. So if we pass two, the output should be four. So here, let's just say fun and then double. So this will be the name of the function. And here we're going to accept a number. So I'm gonna say n for number and the type will be an integer. And inside here, you've seen that basically all I do is this. So print ln and then I can do n times and then two right so if i want to use this and let me just comment this once more so if i want to use this i can just say double in here and then i can say 10 so this will be 20 right so if i run this there we go we have 20. now i basically want to return the value instead of printing okay so this right here doesn't return anything so it's the same as the void in java but all I want is to return a value. So if you want to return a value from functions, you basically say return. So this is the return keyword. And you've seen that it can be used to exit also out of the function. And also what we need here is to say, right, so outside, so outside the last parenthesis, so the closing parenthesis, just add colon and then the return type. So here I can say int. So this function returns an integer and have a look. So now this works beautifully. So this now, if I run, it will not print, right? Because this returns the doubled number, which is 20. 
So here, let's just store this into a variable, val, and then I'm going to say d for double equals to, and if you want, actually, you could just print just like that. If I run it, we should get 20. So this is really cool. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Obviously, if you want to return also strings, you can say string in here, and this will not fail because the data type is different, but you get the gist. Awesome. This is how you return values from functions. If your functions return a single expression, the curly brackets can be omitted and the body is specified after the equal symbol. So meaning that in here, so I can simplify this entire function because here I'm just returning. So I'm getting a value and then I'm returning. So if this is the case, then I can just replace this function. Let me just comment this out. And we can rewrite it as follows. I can say fun double. So everything is the same. So n and this will be integer. And then I have to specify the return type, which is int. And here, this is what's different. So now instead of saying curly brackets, I just say equals. And then I can just basically have my expression. So here I'm going to say n times and then two. So have a look how beautiful this is, right? So function as single expressions, right? So this is something that Java really doesn't have. And I love this. So you can see that nothing changes. If I run this, there we go. Have a look 20. We have the exact same output. Cool. So this only works when your function basically does one and only one thing. So for example, if you were to have this function here, so let me just put it back and let me call it double and then two, for example. So if you were to have print line in here and you do a bunch of other stuff before, you can't really go from this to a single expression function, right? So only if there's one value. So basically one return statement, for example. Cool. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. So you saw functions, the return types and body and whatnot. Let me quickly touch on the return types, which is very important. So if a function in here has the unit, remember the unit, this is optional right so if for example this was unit in here and if i remove this in here this actually is optional okay so void right so if it's not unit then so in here so we have an integer this is always required so the return data type when it's a single function expression in here we can actually omit this so we can get rid of this. So we can do just like this and this works, but only for single function expressions. So I'm going to leave this in here as is, but bear in mind that if it's a single function expression, you don't need the data type. And if it's void, right? So if it's void, so the unit, you don't need the type as well, but as soon as you have the curly brackets, you will always require the return type for your functions. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. When working with functions, if you want to return multiple values from your functions, it's possible by using the pair data type as well as the triple. So for example, with Golang, you are able to return multiple values without even having to use the pair or triple. 
But in Kotlin, if you want to do that, we have to use the pair data type. So it goes as follows. So here, let's just have a function. So here I'm going to say fun. And then I'm going to name it as two and then values. And what we're going to do is we're going to say colon and the return time for this will be a pair just like that. And here we have to have the diamond. And now what is the data time? So let's just say we want to return a string and also an integer just like that. All right. Now within here, we can pretty much return. So if you don't have any logic to do, so let's just say return. And here I'm going to return the string. So here I'm going to say amigos and we have to say two and then the integer type. So here, let's just say 20, for example. So this is how you return multiple values from within your function. If you want to return three values, you basically do the same. But here, let me just have this as three values. And here we're going to name this as triple. So here, just say triple. And basically the data type, let's also have an integer or let's have a character. So char in here. And the triple is a little bit different in a sense that we say triple in here and we pass the values. So first, let me put this on your line. Then we have the second, then we have the third. So here I'm going to say the character is Z, for example, just like that. And we need comma here. And if I indent this, cool, put this on new line and you can see how this function is looking like. So fun tree values, the return type is a triple. It returns a string, an integer and a character. And when we say return, it basically returns the triple in here. So we can change these to single function expressions. So this can go in here and just say equal and same as return and here, right? So this is beautiful code actually. So have a look. Oops, not like that, but like this. So if you wanted to, right? So get rid of that and get rid of that and this and say equals and voila. Cool. So let me just put this one back. So you have it for reference. There we go. And um, this is pretty much it. Now, one cool thing about returning multiple values is that you can destructure them. So whenever you want to use them, you can destructure them as follows. So if I in here within my main method, if I want to consume them, for example, let's consume the two values. So I'm going to say two values, right? So two values. And the values will be stored into a variable. So let's just say val. And now I can say v1 for value one and then v2 equals two and then the two values. And the same with triples, right? So here I'm going to say three values. And here I'm going to name this as, let's just say t1, t2 and then T three. And uh, if you want to print them, let's just print them. So print and here I'm going to print V one and then also V two. Let's duplicate this and also change this to T one, T two and also T and then three with dollar sign. And let's basically have a print line in here. So if I run this, you can see that we have amigos 20, amigos 20, and then Z, right? So basically the values here, they are the exact same thing. So I could have changed this to code, for example, and then 90 or zero, it doesn't really matter, run it. And there we go. So this is actually 
beautiful stuff. So these are the values, so two values, and then three values, one, two, and then three. And actually, one thing that I forgot is with pairs in here, so you can say amigos and then two, or if you also want, you could use, so let's just duplicate this, and I'm gonna say two values and then two, and you can just basically say pair like that and instead of using the two so i prefer two so it's nicer but you could also do this okay so either this or this awesome this is pretty much it catch me on the next one In this section, let's learn about classes and objects, which is pretty much the heart of programming in many programming languages, where we kind of have classes, and these are the blueprints, and then we have the objects, so these are the actual things that we create from the blueprint. So classes is actually found in many programming languages, and Kotlin also has the exact same construct. So if you want to create a class, you use the class keyword in here, and then you give it a name. So here, let's create a class called smart device and add curly brackets. And this right here is the smart device class. Now this class right here, it's the blueprint. So blue and then print. And basically it defines how smart devices are created. So you define the properties. So here, properties and also behaviors. So here we are talking mainly about functions, right? So these are the functions and these are the variables. So either with val or var. So we'll come back to this in a second, but basically you have a class in here where we can define properties and behaviors in here. So let's focus on these later, but this is pretty much the construct of how to create a class. Now, the way that we're going to use this is within our main function in here, we can say, right, so now I wanna say val, and let's say that we have a smart device and we're going to name it as TV equals to, and then just say smart device. Now in languages such as Java, you have to say new in here. So this is not needed in Kotlin. And all you do is you just refer to the class name, just like that. If we want, for example, a phone in here, we say phone equals to, and then smart device. Now, you can see that this right here is the blueprint. So the class is the blueprint. And then the TV and the phone, these are the objects. So we have two objects. Now, classes is something which is not new, to be honest. So if you look into array, for example, so array in here. So array, if I put a mouse in here, have a look. So if I open this and just go into the array.kotlin file and scroll to the top, have a look, public class and then array. So this in here has to do with generics, which means that you can pass either a string or an integer or a double, but basically this is a class, right? And you learn about constructors as well in a second, but with Kotlin, we have many of these classes. And in fact, if I open up project, and in here, I think we can locate. So if you click on the array.kotlin and then click on this button, select open file. So this should take you to where this class is located. And you can see right here. So if I collapse this, have a look. So all of these are classes. You've seen Boolean, you've seen car or character, you've seen double, enum, float, int so int is also a class if i click on it have a look public class int have a look number short throwable so 
including string right here and all of these are classes and um, if i collapse this you should see that there's a bunch of other classes right so have a look pair for example you've seen the pair class in here right so it has um, the first value and the second value and in here you can find a list of a bunch of classes so what we want to do really in a nutshell is for us to have our own classes so that we can model and represent the real world and with classes we can pretty much build anything awesome so now that you basically know that a class is a blueprint and when you instantiate in here this right here is the object so tv and phone are objects and that the blueprint that was used to create these was the smart tv device Awesome. This is pretty much it. Catch me on the next one. Awesome. In here, let's say that within our blueprint, so this class called smart device, we want to have some properties. So maybe you want to have the brand, you want to have the color, you want to have the price. So basically these are the characteristics for a smart device. Also the type, whether it's a phone, whether it's a TV, right? So in here we have all these properties and then the objects themselves, they're able to decide which characteristics that they want to take from the blueprint. So in our case, let's in here say that we have this class called smart device and we want to have the property in here we're going to say var and let's say brand for example so here we need to specify the data type i'm going to say string and here i'm going to basically have empty string okay so brand with an n in here cool so let me actually get rid of this in here and this as well and as we progress you'll see how this will work out Awesome. Now we have this property in here called brand. The type is a string. You can pick literally any type you want. Let's also have another one. So var and then price, for example. And this will be, let's just say double for now in here and equals. And we're going to say 0, 0.0. So this is the initial price. Cool. Now you see that we have two smart devices one it's a tv and the other one it's a phone so maybe we want to also represent the type now for the type i'm going to show you later something called the enum which is a better way of representing types instead of using strings so let's just keep these two properties for now so let's now in here when we have tv let's just say tv we can say tv dot and then have a look i can say brand equals to and here I can say for example Samsung and I can also say TV dot and then price and let's say that this TV in here is I don't know maybe 1000 just like that right so 1000 if you want currency and whatnot you can also have it cool so this is the TV and uh, you can have brand and model and you can basically model this the way you want. But let's just have brand and price. Let's do the same for the phone. So here I want to say phone dot brand equals to. And in here, let's just say Apple. And now I'm going to define the price. So phone dot and then price equals to. In here, we let's just say iPhones are quite expensive. So. There we go. So let's just say 1200, just like that. All right. And if you want, you can basically say Apple and then iPhone. I don't know what's the latest model, 13, 14. I don't even know, but it doesn't matter. Right. So Apple and then iPhone, let's just say the iPhone. And then here you can say Samsung smart TV and then Q is a QLED, something like that. <laughs> Cool. So you can see that now we have two objects in here and they are completely different from each other. Now, in the real world, 
this is actually a thing, right? So this could be your TV and this can be your phone. We can see that we use the same blueprint called smart device because both of them are smart devices to create two separate objects. And you can see that in here, this is how we define the properties. Now, one thing to bear in mind is remember the difference between val and var. So if I also change this from var to val, check what's going to happen. So have a look. The brand for both objects in here, I cannot do this in here, right? And that's because the reassignment, right? So we cannot reassign the actual value. So we'll come back to the val and also data classes later. So this has to do with immutability. But for now, let's just use the var. That basically allows us to assign the values in here after we create the object, like so. Cool. Next, let's go ahead and talk about getters and setters. All right, so we have the TV as well as phone. If I was to print, let's just say print LN in here, and let's just have quotes in here, and let's pretty much just print the TV. So I'm going to say TV dot and then brand followed by TV dot and then price. Okay, so let's take this and then put it here and this will be phone. So phone dot brand as well as price. If I run this, you should see that we have Samsung Smart TV, QLED and then the price and then Apple iPhone and this is the price. Cool. Now we are able to get the brand in here because of this. So here I'm going to say get in here equals to and then field and the same for the price. So let's just add in here get equals to and then field. Now this is actually built into the language and literally you actually don't need it, but this is what's happening under the hood. And you can see that IntelliJ is even telling me that this is redundant. So redundant getter because by default, this is included. Hence, when you say in here, tv.brand, you are allowed to do this, right? So if I was to change this to foo, for example, foo in here. So if I run this, you can see that now in here, foo is replaced with the actual name, right? So, uh, oh, actually brand, my bad, right? So foo, is replaced with the actual brand for both in here, this brand and this brand. So when you say in here, so if I go back, get equals to the field is just going to return this field in here. Cool. So this is how getters work in Kotlin. Also, we have setter. So here, just say set and then value. And then inside, I'm going to say field. So the field, so this field called brand is equal to the actual value. So when we say in here, price, right? Or either brand equals to the value. So the field equals to the value in here. So Apple iPhone. So if I was to change the value in here to bar this time, so you should see that if I run this bar is replaced in both instances. So this is how basically setters work. Now, obviously here, if you want to perform something, so maybe you want to have, I don't know, you want to basically uppercase everything. So uppercase in here, or you want to replace the first case with an uppercase, you never know, right? So this is how you do it. And maybe you want to perform some validation before you set the value. So here you can also perform whatever logic that you want, to be honest. So if I was to run this, you should see that now Samsung TV, Smart QLED, all in uppercase. 
So this is basically setters. Now in here, so let's just leave it as value. So value, and we can take this and uh, basically put it the same in here for the price. But as I said, this right here, it's redundant. We can get rid of it and in here as well. And also here. Awesome. So I just feel like this is very important for you to know what is happening under the hood because getters and setters is something that you find in Java, for example, and in Kotlin, they work a little bit different. Cool. If you have any questions, drop me a message. Otherwise, catch me on the next one. All right, so you've seen properties in here. So these are the variables that specify the attributes of the class object. Now let's look into the methods. So methods slash and then functions. And the functions are simply the behaviors of what the object you create have the capability to perform. So in our case in here, so a smart device might be able to switch on, switch off, might be able to increase the brightness, decrease the brightness, might also be able to increase the volume, record shows and have a list of apps and all of that stuff, right? So basically those are the functionalities, right? So installing an application and installing so all of that is the functionality, right? So if you, for example, take this same example to a class called person, right? So the attributes would be name, skin color, languages, and the behaviors would be eat, sleep, play games, and whatnot, right? So in our case in here, so for our smart device, let's just have two methods. And in here, we're going to basically say, fun and basically the behaviors are pretty much functions and here i'm going to say turn and then on and in here we're going to for now let's just print line and then here i can use the brand is switching on and let's have another method in here i'm going to say turn off in here turn off is let's just say switching and then off all right cool so you can change the name here switching on or turn on it doesn't really matter so now this right here is what the blueprint allows objects to perform so in here let's just scroll up let's use our phone for example if I want to switch off the phone, I can just say phone dot and then turn and then off, for example. So if I run this, you can see that. Have a look. Apple iPhone is switching off. So if I was to do the same for, let's just say TV in here. So TV, right? So our TV, you should see that we have in here, Samsung Smart TV QLED. So it's a long name, is switching off and Apple iPhone is switching off. So you can see that they are two completely independent objects. And when we say brand in here, it refers to the current instance of the current class, right? So this is pretty much how you define behaviors. Now, what we could actually do is we could mutate this behavior so we could have a variable in here so i'm going to say var and in here i'm going to say state and the state in here will be a boolean and initially it will be off right so let's just say false or we could say is and then on for example right so is on or is switched. So let's just say switched on. So this is false. Now, when I turn on, 
in here i'm going to basically say is switched on equals to and then false or actually sorry this is true my bad and let's take this as well is switched on and here so when we invoke turn off this will be false there we go cool and then in here let's just basically have another function in here another behavior so i'm going to say fun and in here i'm going to say get device state so what we're going to do is we're going to say print ln and here i'm going to say dollar sign and then the brand plus the is switched on i'm going to say is on and here dollar sign and then is switched on cool so hopefully you can see how this is working so get device state and if i scroll up in here so you see that with our phone so we turn it off and here let's just say phone dot and then get and then device state so in here if i run this you should see that we have apple iphone is on this is false right whereas so in here if i turn on the tv so turn and then on and then if i say tv dot get and then device state run this we should see that if i scroll up have a look samsung smart tv is on this is true awesome so this is pretty much how you define properties and behaviors within your classes if you have any questions drop me a message otherwise catch me on the next one Okay, dokie. Now the last thing that I want to show you is constructors when working with classes. So you see that here we have our TV and the way we initialize the values, we say tv.brand, tv.price. The same for our phone, phone.brand, phone.price. Now it would be nice if when we actually create the object itself, we were able to initialize these values by passing them inside here well we can achieve this with constructors so let's scroll down to our blueprint so class and this is the smart device and in here what we can do is we can say constructor and then within this constructor we can define the properties so in our case we want brand as well as price and is switched on so i'm going to put this on a new line so i want to press enter in here and let's have the brand so just say brand and the type of it is string comma price the type of it is double and finally is switched on so in fact let's just put everything under a new line and then I'm going to say is switched and then on. And the type of it is a Boolean. Cool. So now in here, you see that we have the constructor and now we can pass the brand price and switched on. So if I was to in here, let's just change the TV for now. Now in here, you see that this is complaining because we need to pass the values so here we just take this from here and here i'm gonna basically add a new line and then paste that in there and also the price which was a thousand in here so a thousand and whether it was on or off so what we're going to do let's just scroll down and let's have a default value equals to i think what did we say we said false so false and you've learned about this in here so this also works within constructors and this is pretty much it so you can see that now when we define our tv 
we don't have to say tv.brand, tv.price. So we could just use the constructor itself, which means that I can comment this out in here, just like that. And if I try to run this, so let's just go back in here and I'm going to add empty for now here. So zero, zero, and we'll come back to this in a second because otherwise it's just complaining about it. So if I run this in here, so what I want you to see is that, have a look, we have 0, 0.0 is switching on and then is on true. But really what we need is to say Samsung, basically the name of it, right? And the reason why this is doing this is because we are passing these values in here, Samsung, so for the brand and for the price, right? But we're not assigning them to anywhere. So what we have to do in this case is two things. So we could actually say, right, so the brand will be this brand. So we just reassign that. And then for the price, the same here. And for the is switched on, we can say is and then switched on. And if you want all together, you can get rid of the type just like that. So let's just get rid of the type. So it's not needed and just say equals. Cool. Now in here, if I run this, now we basically assign the values. Can you see Samsung Smart TV? It's now populated and we're good to go. Or we have something even better. So if I put my mouse in here, it says property is explicitly assigned to parameter brand. So it can be declared directly in constructor. So what we can do is we can get rid of the brand. So let's just do for the brand first. So we get rid of it and literally it's just get, getting rid of it. The same for the price in here and for switched on. So we can move it to constructor. And basically uh, if I just undo this so you can see. So what we're doing here is basically the difference is that this in here becomes a variable inside of the constructor. So var, var, and then var. Okay. So which means that now we can get rid of this and all the properties are within the constructor itself. So if I run this, you can see that this still works. So Samsung smart TV, and then this is the price is switching on is on true. So if I hide this, one other thing that I want to show you is that you see that we have constructor. So this actually it's not needed. So let's get rid of it and it becomes much simpler. So look how beautiful this code is now. Cool. So that's pretty much it. You've learned about constructors. You've learned about the properties in here for the objects and also the behaviors which are functions if you have any questions drop me a message otherwise catch me on the next one cool you saw constructors and before you saw that we did add some random values in here for the brand and price for our phone so what we want to do is the ability of having the ability of using the constructor in here like we did here but also have the ability of not even passing something inside right so we want to have multiple constructors if possible so the way to do it in kotlin is the following so you can see that this is actually complaining but we have a couple of things that we can do so if we want to, we can basically say that basically these will have a default value and the default value for these can be null. So if I say equals to null in here, this complains because we need to add the question mark. So remember before, so this is how we handle nulls. So I can say equals to and then null. Now, if I scroll up, you can see that. So we are able to do this, right? So basically pass nothing inside. So this is one technique or so let's just get rid of this in here or what we can do is so let's just say basically 
like this. What we can do is have a secondary constructor and we can have as many as we want. So we can say constructor in here. And basically, if you want, you can basically have, you know, variables again, and maybe you want a new variable, for example, or a new property foo, and you define the type string, for example. And what we have to do here actually is be able to call the main constructor and pass these values in here. So let's not do this for now. And I'll show you in a second. So here, what we do is we say colon in here and then say this. And this pretty much refers to the main constructor. And you can see that now we have to pass the price as well as the switched on and the brand actually. And here, this is the point where we can basically, I think if we say null, this will not work, right? Because that cannot be null. So we just pass empty fields, right? So here, this will be 0.0. .0. So this is another way in here. And for example, what's cool about this, so let's just scroll up. You can see that here, this works. So what's cool about this is that we can have, so let's say that we want to have another constructor where we want to be able to only pass the brand, for example, right? So here I can say var and then brand. And let me put it on a new line in a second. So string, so var brand, just like this. There we go. And then we say this and we pass the brand from this constructor into the main one, like so. And it looks like we're not allowed to have var, that's fine, on a secondary constructor, that's cool. So we say brand and then string, and then we pass the brand inside, which means that now in here, I can basically remove the brand from here and then just pass it within the constructor. So get rid of that. And then here, brand, which is Apple iPhone. And hopefully now you can see how this is working out, right? So there we go. So this is pretty much how you can use multiple constructors. And also if you want these to be null, so let's just say these can be null. So just add question mark in here for both price and brand, right? And if you want also for um, the switch done in here, just like that. And with this, it means that, so here we could just say no. And here we could just also say no. And obviously you see that we're not even using this constructor. So IntelliJ is complaining about it. But if I was to create a new device, so here let's just say device or smart device, assign this to a variable. So there we go, val, and then I'm going to name this as laptop, for example. There we go. So you can see that we have a couple of constructors, one that we don't pass anything, another one that we only pass the brand and another one that we pass all the fields brand as well as price. And this is pretty much it. And you can see also here we have default, right? So defaults and uh, yeah. So if I run this, everything should work as before. Have a look, Apple iPhone, as well as the Samsung Smart TV QLED. Cool, this is pretty much everything on multiple constructors. Catch me on the next one. Now let's look into how can we get the string representation of any object. So, I think before you saw that when we printed the TV in here, so if we print TV like so, run, you should see that we get smart TV and then at, and then this random number, which is the hash code. So this really doesn't tell us anything. And more often what you want to do is the ability of printing the actual values, i.e. smart TV, the price and all other attributes related to the object itself. So instead of you saying dot and then brand 
and then dot and then for example the price and weather is on i think right here so instead of you doing all of this what we want to do is just the ability of so in here we want to just print the object so just say print and we should get the exact same information for that what we have to do is under our blueprint so smart device so this class which can be found here let's go straight to the bottom and in here what we're going to do is let's right click and then we're going to generate to string so to string is quite obvious on the name so here we want to select all of these fields so brand price and is switched on basically all the properties okay and this will actually override so override fun to string and this will return the string representation for the object so here you can see that it says return and then we have the brand price is switched on and we'll have all the fields associated from the generation screen that we just selected so now it means that if we run this so if we run this we no longer should see the random string but instead you can see that we have the class name then brand equals small tv price and all the other fields cool so this is pretty much how you get the string representation for your objects catch me on the next one Let us now learn how to perform equality when we have our own classes and objects. So in here we have this TV and let's just leave it as TV for the name. And let's say that we want to have the exact same TV and we're going to call it TV and then two. So TV one and then TV two. Now I want to know whether these two televisions they are the same or these two smart devices are the same so the brand is the same the price is the same so what we want to do is to check whether they are the same so if i say print line and then tv1 equals so double equals and then tv and then two in here so if i run this this will give us false so you might be saying hold on these are the exact same televisions so what is happening well when we perform this equality so equals and then equal so two equals this is just saying whether tv1 refers to the same place in memory as tv2 which obviously they are different right so tv1 is stored differently than tv2 however if i was to change this so let's just get rid of that and i say tv2 equals to tv and then one in here if i run this this now should give us true because they refer to the same location right so if you change tv1 tv2 will also change now let me go back in here and leave this as is now in kotlin things work a little bit different and that is we have the triple equality so in here equals equals and then equals so three equals and basically this is used to check the reference so whether these two refer to the same place in memory so if i run this this will be false in here and if I change this to TV1, this will be true, right? Now, when this actually comes into play is, so you saw that either this or triple equals, this is the same. However, if we want to check whether the contents of these two objects are the same, right? So before we had, so in here, we had TV2 
with the exact same contents. Here, the brand is the same, the same for the price. So if we want to perform this equality, we use this equals in here. And what we have to do is under our blueprint, we have to override the equals and hash code. So literally right after to string, right click and go to generate and here equals and hash code. So again, select all members in here, leave everything checked and then create. Now, what this is actually doing is basically performing the equality based on all fields. So first is actually checking whether they refer to the same place in memory and here have a look triple equals. So this refers to the same place in memory, right? And then if this is the case, then they are the same object. Then it checks whether they are of different classes. And if they're not, then basically return false. Otherwise, it performs the casting. And then here, then we are comparing all fields. So brand, price, as well as the Boolean. Cool. So if I now scroll up and in here, if we run this, this now should give us true. Have a look. So before, without the equals and two string, this was given us false. But now it's behaving correctly. Also, if I was to say triple equals, so in here, let's just say double quotes on both sides in here. And what I want to do is I want to say equals in here and then dollar sign curly bracket and end curly bracket on this side in here. And let's do the same for this. So this will be triple equals and then dollar sign curly bracket and then close curly bracket on this side with double quotes. Cool. And here, let's just have triple equal. So if we run this now, you can see that are they equal? Yes, because we did override the equals and hash code and are they equal in memory? So this is actually comparing the memory location. Okay. Let me just add a comment memory location. So run once more and you can see that this is true because all the fields are the same. And in here, this will return false because they don't refer to the same memory location. Awesome. If I scroll up or down, actually, so you see that we have the equals, but also hash code. Now this in here has to do when we are dealing with hash maps. So let's not focus about this and we'll look into this later. But for now, this is pretty much it. So just to prove a point, if I was to in here change, for example, this to Samsung and then TV, for example. Now, when we perform this right here, so are they equal? This will be false because brand for TV2 is different than brand for TV1 and they don't point to the same memory. So if I was to run this, this will be false and then false. I will look false and also false. Awesome. And this is how you perform equality on objects. So I'm going to revert this so you have it for reference. If you have any questions, drop me a message. Otherwise, catch me on the next one. As you can see, Kotlin, it's a powerful and beautiful language. If you enjoyed this video, literally just take one second and smash the like button. Also, if you haven't subscribed, do so. And as I said, this is part of the massive course that I'm planning for Kotlin. So head over to the website and stay up to date with the latest recordings and also give me some suggestions for what you want to see on Kotlin. But you'll see the list of topics which I have already planned. And in case you have any other ideas, I would like to hear from you. This is pretty much it. Comment down below. Let me know what are the videos that you want to see next. And I'll catch you on the next one. Assalamu alaikum.